Talk Recorded live. Hello, everybody. This is Mike again, and um, I'm with uh, York from Juggler 66. I got Wayne Michaels with us at the Avenue of Light, and um, hopefully we'll have some other folks join in, like uh, Tom Fress and um, Walt Stickle. But they just said they were going to. So, but anyways, t- today's kind of it shouldn't be, but at times people find it a touchy subject. Uh, I think it's an important question. Uh, I titled the show, Why Didn't the Reformers Take the Reformation All the Way? And I'm more than willing to rephrase the title of that show as we go on. If it, but I think here we want to address the question, you know, why didn't they? You know, what happened? How did the Counter-Reformation be... How was it so successful? And... Um, Maybe what can we do about it? So, but anyways, but Jorg has generously uh, offered to moderate this and uh, lead lead off the discussion. And so I'm going to hand it over to Jorg. And uh, there, there you go, my friend. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Enjoy the time that you have right now with other things that are also important. And feel free to join in whenever you want to. Um. Hello, everybody that's listening to the call, and uh, especially a very, very warm welcome, of course, to my friend Michael Wayne from AvenueOfLight.com. How are you doing, Wayne? Blessings to you, my brother. You are a long time, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to talk about me, but, you know, good days and bad days. I've been having some real bad days lately, and... Uh, You know, just uh, trying to struggle along to get by and giving glory to God for all things, the serenity that he's blessed me with up here in the mountains and uh, following Matthew 24. And it's really an odd thing that both of my children, within the last two weeks, have asked me independently, you know, am I still happy here? Am I still glad I moved here and all this? You know, and I don't... I don't understand it. It's like they want to hear that I've caved in because, you know, I've got problems with the house, problems with this, problems with that, problems with that. You know, the Messiah said we'd have tribulation in this world, and certainly we have. And uh, I'm thankful for all things that I do have. You know, I've got a roof over my head. i got a wood stove that keeps me warm. i got clothes on my back, and he's sustaining me right now to uh, his advantage and purpose for whatever that might be, the suiting. And all I can say is praise and bless his name. I'm thankful for you and Michael and all our brothers in Christ, no matter where they are and in what mindset and frame they're in. And, uh, you know, some of us, we get prideful and high-minded and set in our ways as part of human nature. And uh, it's not a good thing to do, as far as I'm concerned. You know, and I'll just tell you, you are because I haven't spoken with you. I've heard Michael and others speaking greatly about knowledge. We need knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. (laughs) And I know you understand where I'm coming from, so I'm going to iterate on this that I would tell anyone who listens to this show ever, they should seek heavenly wisdom and not earthly knowledge because that's what Satan offered Eve. And that's what caused her fall, because she wanted to be as God. I don't yeah, want to knowledge. be as God, my brother. No, absolutely. Knowledge, knowledge. Uh, when, when you say that we have knowledge, I just, uh, uh, I, I just um, understand it in the same word as you understand enlightenment. Yes, it says knowledge uh, puffeth up. This is, a, the, the, this is the teaching of men and not the teaching of God. Uh, knowledge. No, we need wisdom. Well, yes. we need spiritual wisdom. Yes. Most Heavenly of all. wisdom. Yes. Heavenly wisdom. Yeah. And, and you know, just, just to come a little bit to the subject that we are on tonight, because uh, Michael called this broadcast, uh, Why Didn't the Reformers Go All the Way? Correct. Um, you know... You, you know already a little bit my background and how I became a Christian and how I was raised, right? Because we have had several uh, several calls um, off a broadcast like this uh, where I explained a lot of these. 
And one thing that I repeatedly said to everybody when they asked me, how did you come to Christianity? How did you come to uh, research the New World Order and all that stuff? I always said, when I was brought up, even though I was brought up in the best sense, my mother could bring me up as a Protestant coming from north of Hamburg and uh, living in the German state of Prussia, actually, which still, uh, which always was a, uh, a Protestant state, even though it gave refuge to the Jesuits while their suppression from 1773, along with Russia. Um, when I was raised there in the most Protestant way that my mother could raise me, because we are not very active in the leading, <clears throat> I always said that I do not understand where the difference between this Protestantism that I've been that I've been told is and and, and Catholicism, because when we went to church, we went on church to Sunday. When we were in the church, we were offered, uh, we were offered this ritual of this Last Supper, you know, this Eucharist that yeah. they do in the in the Roman Catholic Church. I ate the Jesus cookie, as I call it, and uh, drank that wine in that glass they offered as being, now you are eating the, the, my flesh and now you are drinking my blood, the pastor said at that time. So this uh, substantia uh, substantiation, is that the right word? Transubstantiation, yes. Transubstantiation, yes, sorry. Yes. I, was, mm -hmm. uh, I was forgetting the, the word trans. Yeah, this is transubstantiation. Event substitution um, that was celebrated there in the so-called Protestant Church was exactly the same as in the Roman Catholic Church. They had in the Protestant Church uh, crosses with the hanging Jesus on there, which to me is idol worship. Absolutely, yes. yes. So, whenever I was confronted with the Church, I never saw a real difference. That probably is because I grew up in the 70s and 80s, uh, and in that time already all the so-called Protestant churches, all the evangelical churches were already infiltrated by the Jesuits, were teaching the same spiritual formation in the Protestant churches as they did in the Catholic churches, and there was not... Um, uh, not such a big difference anymore because of that. But you know, when you come in there as a, as a child who knows nothing, and then you've been told, well, Protestant is something different than Catholic, and then you don't see a difference, or nobody can explain the difference that you asked it. Also because I was not that deep in, in the belief that I said, I really have to question this right now, and I'm going to research it right now. I, I was busy with other things as a child. <laughs> maybe Maybe that's a shame, but that's the way it was, you know. Yep. Uh, I, I, I never saw a big difference between these two. Now, the point is that last week, uh, Michael and I had a broadcast. We do this broadcast about a conversation with Dr. 66, and I think it was the sixth broadcast already. And somewhere in the end, this subject came up with, with uh, what always, always bothered me. And uh, it truly bothers me since now I'm, uh, I'm a Christian myself. When... Uh, taking the Bible as the basis of your belief system and of everything that you are trying to learn and trying to do and trying to analyze and you take the Bible as the basis and everywhere in the Bible it is said and even Jesus said it, I think it is in Revelation 20 or 21 or 22 or whatever um, that, he, uh, that uh, he who loves me is he who holds my, uh, uh, who holds my commandments Right. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. If you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> and um, when when you go to the commandments, then there are ten of them. Yes, sir. And these ten commandments are for the first time written in, in the Bible in uh, the chapter 20 of Exodus. Correct. <clears throat> after the Israelites were um, led out by the hand of God from the captivity, the slave captivity of, G, of, uh, of, uh, of Egypt. And they were at Mount Sinai in the desert. And Moses went up that hill where God resided. And God wrote in his own, with his own finger the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. And he didn't do that once. He did that twice. That's right. But and I realize this. The Ten Commandments also were given at creation when Adam and Eve were created. So this has been from the very first day 
through the beginning up until even when Moses received that twice. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a moral law, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is the moral law. And everybody who, are, that is the difference between people who believe in the Bible and people who believe in uh, evolution. Evolutionists cannot have any moral. Right. Because, because they are just descendants of a stone and they have the same DNA as a banana and um, as the ape in the zoo over there and as their dog they have running around because it all, com- it all comes from the same source. So why should they have any morals? That's all psychology a real evolutionist, and teachings. You know? yeah. A real evolutionist cannot have any morals because there is no God. I just this afternoon listened to a video that was very interesting where someone mentioned this guy who in the 70s or whatever in the United States of America ate, uh, killed 17 people and ate some of them. Who made that statement? Uh, yeah, if there is no God, why should I? Why should I not care? Why should I do that? Because I'm not responsible for anything, you know. So anyway, this 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 law is very uh, very important. These ten commandments are very important, <clears throat> and we have to see that the original ten commandments are split in two parts. Namely, the first four deal with the relationship that man should have with his God. And the second six commandments deal with the relationship that man should have with other men. Right. Right? Yes. So, um, when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he means keep all of my commandments. That's absolutely right. And if that wasn't so, then there's the question, yeah, why does the Roman Catholic Church change the commandments? Because they uh, changed the second commandment of idol worship. Uh, because it fits their agenda better. Uh, well, also, you are, you know, I've said this all along to people that since I came to the knowledge of understanding the Sabbath, you know, why is every entertainment there is on the earth today held from Friday to Saturday night? Because it's a direct slap in God's face, breaking his law, breaking the commandment, honoring Satan and sun worship. Absolutely. originated in Egypt from Pharaoh, the most rebellious human that's ever been on this earth against Almighty God and his son. And his title first was Pontifus Maximus. Today, that same title is carried by the Pope of Rome. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the New Testament, it tells you in Matthew 24... Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For the people who want to say the Sabbath is done away with, there's nowhere in the Word of God does it state that the Sabbath has been done away with or annulled. But the Catholic Church has taken upon itself in 321 by Constantine and Eusebius to change the Sabbath day to the day of the sun, the first day of the week, because they say that Christ rose on that day. If a person would study their Bible, they would look in the book of Luke, and they could find the true resurrection explained explicitly, perfectly clear, without any question or doubt. So, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. But you know, the, the the point is that when there are a lot of people who say. Um, like Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I come to fulfill the law. Right. And they say that the law that was fulfilled are the moral laws, and that is absolutely a lie. Right. The law that Jesus fulfilled was the um, ceremonial law. That's right. That were the laws that, uh, <clears throat> that Moses wrote on pergaments and that were transported with the Ark of the Covenant, but outside of the Ark. Yep. Inside of the ark were the stone tablets, and they still yep. are there. And they are a copy of the tabernacle that is in heaven. Right. So don't tell me that Jesus fulfilled any law that is now not, now not uh, important anymore, because if that was so, if that was so that the Ten Commandments don't uh, work, or don't, or don't have to be respected in our day anymore, then I can kill, I can lie, I can covet, I can steal, I can, yeah, do everything uh, opposite to to the Ten Commandments and still go to heaven? Doesn't seem right. 
No. So when I have to keep all the commandments, that means I have to keep all the commandments. Now, let me be clear for the people who listen here. I am not a Seventh-day Adventist. Absolutely, Absolutely not. neither am I, my brother. I but, there is a discussion, and will, yeah, there, but there is a discussion, and it will come up, come up tonight, even with the things that I have prepared on reading, because um, I have an article here, is the relationship between Luther and Seventh-day Adventists, and that deals with uh, Luther's way of uh, handling the Sabbath, and I'm going to read that, um, and then we can discuss that. But there is the same stuff that many people say, the, the, uh, the Sabbath today is only for the Jews. Excuse me, that's first why and for made, all. Your, that's first why I made all. the point, brother, it was given at creation before there was ever a Jew on this earth. Yeah, my point, I have, I have two points on that. The first point is, of course, the Sabbath was given on the seventh day of creation, meaning in the first six days God did all the work. On the sixth day he, uh, he created all the animals and man and woman and rested on the seventh day and told men to, uh, to, to accept the seventh day as a rest day and a day of worship. Because the seventh day, the seventh day was God's signature on That's creation. Right, yep. Like when you have a painter who finishes a painting... At the end, the painting is finished when he sets his handwriting on there that you can associate this painting to someone. God wanted every person on earth to know that he was the one who created it all, and that's why he created that seventh day. Otherwise, we could have done the six days also. But that's why he created the seventh day, first and for all. And the second point is, when we are talking about who were these Ten Commandments given to, those were the Israelites. Israel, as far as I understand the Bible, and you can discuss me on that uh, 24 hours on 24 hours a day, I don't care. Israel is 12 different tribes. Judah is just one of them. So if anybody tells me the Sabbath is just for the Jews, what about the other 11 tribes? Right? So, but I will, and, I will say this. Yeah. Today, since Christ walked on this earth, the Israelites of today are circumcised in the heart. They're not the flesh and blood people that live over on that little piece of dirt in the Middle East. The tribes have been scattered across the whole world. But Christ came for those who would adhere to his teachings, repent of their sin, as we're all born in sin, and have a circumcised heart. And without that circumcised heart, you can't please God because that's by faith. As Abraham, Noah, on and on. So, my point that I came up with this last broadcast on this conversation of Jekyll 66 when I was together with, with Michael on, I said, the reformers didn't go all the way, to my opinion, in two points. And the first point is, and I'd like to get your opinion on that, Wayne, the first point is, we are talking about a reformation. Luther, for example, came out of the Roman Catholic Church. He was an Augustinian monk yep. in Germany. Right. And his idea was to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And their doctrines, yes. On the other hand, his studies showed him that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. With the Antichrist, the Pope, on the top. How in God's name can you reform the synagogue of Satan? You want to convert Satan to believe in God again and be obedient to God again? 
He wasn't obedient to God all along. So, so you know. So how can you reform the synagogue of Satan? That's my first question. Yeah, it's impossible. If God and cast him out, if, point, if the, the point, Messiah cast so, him sorry, out of heaven, that should be answer enough for that in its own self. I, I don't want to lose my point here. Because no, that's fine. Go ahead. There, there's a difference between a revolution and a rebellion. Mm-hmm. The difference is, in the revolution, you have rebels coming up, questioning the system that is existing, rebelling against it, fighting it, let's say overthrowing it, but then afterwards they will use the same organizing structure that was before just putting their people in there and taking it over. A very good example, for example, is the fall of the Soviet Union, where in Russia, for example, everything was still the same. The KGB was just renamed to another name, the FSB, but still stayed the same. All the political hierarchy was was the same, just other people in there. So-called no communists anymore, but it was the same structure. And you have that with all revolutions. And a rebellion, on the other hand, is going to make away with the whole structure of the existing power structure and building it up from scratch, anew, completely anew. And you cannot have a revolution in the synagogue of Satan. Then you have to have a rebellion. Means you really have to tear it down to the ground. It has to vanish. It has to be done done away with. And those are two points that I think that, in my opinion, in my understanding as a Christian, I think the reformers didn't go far enough. And I don't know why they didn't do it. And it's not that I'm hammering on Luther. I'm just seeking out Luther as the uh, the beginner as of the it. main character because because he was the most um, the most known especially in Germany where I come from and uh, it was because of Luther that we had that Concil of Speyer in 1529 where the word Protestant was formed that is something else that we did on another broadcast uh, where I told that already um, where the word Protestant came from, that was this meeting that they had in Spire in, in 1529. Uh, and there came this word Protestant, uh, Protestant from, you know. So, these questions are bothering me. These questions are bothering me from why did Luther and why didn't the other reformers go all the way and say, well, when we, go, when we rebel against the Roman Catholic Church and we say... Um, this sin forgiving and this uh, mass holding and, uh, and all this stuff, this is all wrong and the Pope is the Antichrist and, and uh, he is actually the, the placeholder of Satan here on earth, uh, then you also have to see wh- wh- why, I, uh, why are we going to introduce then a Sunday school which is all around the world and in, in all evangelical churches. You have Sunday school. Why? That should be Saturday, right? Well, because of all the fallen state of man, with Satan running this earth, controlling this earth, the Messiah's kingdom is not here, but in heaven, as you know. And, you know, he's the prince of darkness and the prince of this world, and our Messiah is the light. So yeah. everything here is going to be corrupt, the fallen state of man, the sinful nature of man, and following wickedness, you know. And that's why Christ came and God sent Christ, that we would have a chance to repent, to be taken back into the graces of our God, and to be able to dwell in the kingdom of life forever. Now, Luther, Gutenberg, the press, all the other reformers, during their time, I guess, they did what they could do. Why they never stood out and spoke explicitly against the day of the sun, I can't answer that, York. I don't know if I've ever read or heard of even an answer for that. All I know is Lucifer's sun worship, which is Babylon mystery religion, 
which I explained last night, 666. There were 666 gods in Rome that are still worshipped today for every act and everything that you do, every breath you make, every move you make. They don't honor the God of creation. And at the top of that 666 God that they worship is titled Pontifus Maximus, which today is the Pope of Rome. And he is the high priest of Lucifer's sun worship, which is the worship of Horus, which is on the back of your dollar bill. And in Nua Coeptus Novus Ordus Seclorum, is stating perfectly that they are going to set the Pope in Jerusalem, according to Daniel 11.5, and all the dissenters out here say that's all futurism. No, that is the final Antichrist's place of dwelling, and he will be dictator of this earth. Mm -hmm. Now, why the Reformers didn't carry it further, I can't answer that. I don't know. I really don't know. Certainly, Luther nailed the 95 Thesis. That's a lot of things to pull out, just back in his day. Yeah. And now we look at the doctrines we see out here that the Catholic Church has put through the years, through the years, it's more suppression, ruling, and taking away everything from everybody on this earth, including the free worship that God has given us to worship him and his son. And certainly, as I read last night from the book, and Michael can tell you and the listeners also that everything the Catholic Church teaches is an absolute lie and a slap in God's face and an honor to Lucifer, a Satan. Mm -hmm. And to be Absolutely. a satanic priest, do you realize you first have to be a Catholic priest? And if that isn't a mouthful, I don't know what is, and people can check that out. William Shinobolin, who was into that, whether he is or not, I can't say, I'm not his judge, but he provided that information on a uh, DVD he produced. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, anyway, um, I found two texts that I uh, would like to read. Okay. That gives a uh, I found two texts that I like to read that gives a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit of insight of how the reformers watched um, the Sabbath question. And um, we can discuss what I'm reading. Uh, you can even interrupt me while I'm reading when you say, "Well, let's talk about this," because I know there are some things that, is, uh, that are not uh, that are not absolutely correct in there, and we can discuss about that. But I would start reading, uh, if, if you allow me now, Wayne. Um, please, please. This, this article that I have that is from 1955, okay. written by a certain M. Daniel Walter in the Ministry Journal, that is an international journal for pastors. And the article is called, Is There a, a Relationship Between Luther and Seventh-day Adventists? So it's all right that I start reading that right now, or do you have anything else to say before I want to start reading? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we just know in 321, Constantine, through Eusebius, changed the true Seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week so he could create paganized Christianity, which we have here today, inclusive of yeah. all... The cross worship, and I did a great reading on that last night, not great on myself, but the reading was great, about the origins of the cross. And the people worship mm -hmm. the cross more than the one that died on it. And that is really idolatry and yeah, an of abomination. Course. Please go ahead. Please read. That's right. <clears throat> okay. In hearing this. Okay. And whenever there comes up something, then you may interrupt me, all right? No, I'll, please, I want you to read it. I want to hear it first. Please read it. Okay. The Sabbath. I love you, brother. I love you too, Wayne, and everybody on this call. So let's go along with it. While Luther repeatedly asserted that the commandments were not repealed by Christ, yet he thought that there was no need to observing the seventh-day Sabbath. He considered the Sabbath as pertaining to the Mosaic ceremonial law. When somebody asked him, but did not Jesus himself say that not a jar or a tittle of the law shall pass away? Luther retorted, quote, Jesus was, was not speaking of the ceremonial law, but of the moral law, which was in existence long before Moses and the patriarchs. It is, in fact, the universal law of humanity, though Moses gave the clearest expression to it. 
Similarly, the Sabbath or rest day is a universal law in order that the people may assemble for the worship of God. But that they should assemble on the seventh day applies only in the case of the Jews. And the observance of this day is not incumbent on other people. End quote. And this is just a little uh, second where I want to intervene and stop the reading because Luther said the seventh day applies only in the case of the Jews. Right. Yeah, what Bible is Luther reading when he states a lie like this? That seventh day applies only in case of Israel, which is 12 tribes in the Old Testament, and not in just it, only the Jews. In that case, and hearing what you've read, I can only have one response, York. I would think myself that Luther, if, if this is true, if this writing is true and not by a Jesuit trying to destroy Luther's credibility, if it was really true that he did state such thing, then I'd have to believe that it was from holding on to the teachings from the Catholic Church, which he'd been brought up in all the years. Well, we will have more quotes of him, and we will even have a discussion. Hey, gentlemen. Hey, gentlemen can you, uh, hey Tom, can you hear me? Let me turn on the mic. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, Tom Press to join us. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Hi, Tom. Tom. Welcome. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. I just started reading this article from um, M. Daniel Walter from the... Um, a ministry journal from 1955 is the relationship between Luther and Seventh-day Adventists to get our discussion a little bit starting because there are a lot of quotes that Luther made and um, Wayne made an interesting point that uh, if this does not come from a Jesuit no that surely does not come so because there are much more than this one quote um, that will come along because I also have a second uh, in, uh, a second article prepared uh, where we would go into his discussions that he has with a certain uh, Andreas Rudolf B. Karlstadt, a great apostle of the Seventh-day Sabbath, uh, who was born in Bavaria in 1480 and died in Switzerland in 1541, so he was about the same age of Luther, and they met each other. They were, he was a personal friend and co-worker, and we also go into that, so... Uh, no, I don't think that this is uh, a Jesuit agenda. But this is the first quote of Luther here, and there you can hear already where he is in error when he says the seventh day applies only in case of the Jews. I just wanted to intervene this here at, at this moment because I do not agree with that statement. That's what I wanted to make clear before we go any further. And now I'm going to start continue reading. Or is there something, Tom, that uh, you would like to go in there because you have already, already listened a few minutes in, I think. Is, is there something that you want to say first? No, I only I only want to say that uh, God didn't change the Sabbath. Man did. And so uh, I'll just listen until I catch up with you here. Okay. So then I'm going to continue reading. He argued repeatedly that those who kept the Jewish Sabbath should also practice circumcision. He said, if Karlstadt writes more about the Sabbath, Sunday must give way for the Sabbath, that is Saturday, must be kept holy. He would really in all things make Jews out of us and require circumcision. Luther quoted in his collection Galatians 4 uh, verse 3 which I just want to read to you uh, but uh, could not be loaded so I cannot look that up right now. Uh, For if I testify again uh, to every man that is circumcised uh, that he is a debtor to, to do the whole law. Um, but again, I say the circumcision was of the heart. It was not of the flesh. Yeah, absolutely. That is where Luther, again, is an error yeah, about the circumcision, because the circumcision uh, of, of the uh, male sexual organ, that is something that belonged to the ceremonial law yes. that uh, Jesus did away with by dying on the cross for us. Absolutely. I agree, Wayne. I'm absolutely on your point yet. I, I'm just reading what Luther said, right? The only thing so I can him say would be the fact that maybe because Lutheran was indoctrinated in Catholicism so much, it swayed his, his, his understanding. I don't know. I can't imagine it being the case. I really just can't. You know, I can't even imagine yeah. it, really. 
just uh, continuing reading them now. Please. Luther believed that the Sabbath must be kept, but that Christians were free to observe any day as the Sabbath. It is difficult to assert precisely what Karlstadt's beliefs and practices were. Quote, we do not know whether Karlstadt ever took a positive stand for the seventh-day Sabbath, but we do know that many groups of Sabbath keepers were in existence in various places of Central Europe after he began to write on the Sabbath observance, end quote. There were Christians who kept the seventh-day Sabbath in Luther's time, and he referred to them on several occasions. In discussing them, he was so convinced that the seventh-day Sabbath was not the true day of rest that he went so far as to say that even the patriarchs did not keep the Sabbath. Concerning the Sabbath keepers or Sabbaths, Luther said this, quote, We find in our day in Moravia a foolish rebel folk that call themselves the Sabbaths. They contended that we must, according to the Jewish regulations and customs, keep the Sabbath, and perhaps they will yet in time lay a similar requirement for circumcision. There are in Austria and Moravia, and it is reported to me, people at this time at, um, at this time that in Jewish manner keep the Sabbath and compel circumcision. If these people come in contact with people that are not properly instructed in words God, they will do great damage. End quote. The Augsburg Confession of 1530, Augsburg in Germany, the most authoritative statement of Lutheran belief, although Luther was not personally present at Augsburg, deals in Article 28 with the question of the Lord's Day. Quote, Those who judge that by the authority of the Church the observance of the Lord's Day instead of the Sabbath day was ordained as a thing necessary do greatly err. Scripture has abrogated the Sabbath day, for it teaches that since the gospel has been revealed, has been revealed, all the ceremonies of the old law can be omitted. And yet, because it was necessary to appoint a certain day that the people might know when they ought to come together, that appears, uh, it appears that the church, the apostles, designated the Lord's day for this purpose. And this day seems to have been chosen all the more for, its, uh, for this additional reason, that Mass uh, might have an example of Christian liberty and might know that the keeping neither of the Sabbath nor of any other day is necessary. End quote. Seventh-day Adventists are obviously disappointed to find this interpretation in Luther's teachings. It should be noticed that on the one hand he affirms the eternal value of the law of God, and on the other, he dissociates from the dialogue, uh, from the decalogue of the fourth commandment. In Luther's catechism, it was the third. The Sabbath is in the heart of the eternal law of God, and its observance is one of the fruits that appear when a man is justified by faith. On the other hand, Seventh-day Adventists may catch from Luther the spirit of the true Sabbath of the observance. He insisted that the Lord's Day should be kept holy as a sacred act of worship. He was outspoken on this point and vehemently criticized those who transgressed the Sabbath. He who makes the Lord's Day an occasion for gluttony, carousing, gambling, dancing, lounging about, uh, about or whoring, he who is given the idleness and he who sleeps when he should be at divine service, and he who gets about or gossips instead of attending worship, he who works or trades without necessity, he who, were, he who does not pray and meditate upon the sufferings of Christ, not repent of the sin and plead for grace, celebrating the day solely by dressing, eating, and the formal observance. He who admits his, his toils and tribulation is not resigned to the dispensations of providence. He who is rather a help than an obstacle to others in living contrary to this commandment. Also sluggish in, in matters pertaining to God's service comes under his head. End quotes. While Luther misses the beauty and the blessing that comes with the true observance of the biblical Seventh-day Sabbath as a sign of creation, redemption, and sanctification, he soundly insists on the proper observance of the Lord's Day. He was wrong as to the day, <clears throat> but right regarding the spirit of its observance. Would that Seventh-day Adventist who... Uh, would that Seventh-day Adventist who have uh, the true light on this teaching observed the day of rest as fervently and honestly as Luther wanted the Lord's Day to be observed. 
Luther played his part magnificently and with courage, but it was for the remnant people later to bring about a reformation, correcting the day to be observed. Now we deal with the eschatology question in this matter. Luther lived in a stormy age, seething with new ideas and revolutionary concepts and groaning with agonies and, uh, of a laborious rebirth, the Renaissance. Luther stood in the midst of the tempest uh, that resulted in many ideological and armed conflicts. But the cause of the greatest anxiety to his age, especially 1528 to 1530, was the constant menace of Mohammed and onslaught. This threat had been hovering over the West ever since the Mohammedans succeeded in 711 in entering Europe by the western gate of Spain. The situation became alarming when later the seemingly irresistible pressure from the East placed Europe in a huge pincer that threatened to crush it. As the Turks approached Vienna, the mounting anxiety was reflected in Luther's writings and talks. He preached a crusade against the Turks, applying the term Dog and Magog to them. Luther was so impressed by the precariousness of the times in 1528 that he expected the end to come uh, before he completed the translation of the Old Testament. For this reason, he purposed to translate the book of Daniel so that it might be brought as quickly as possible to the poor Christians of these last times before everything perished. The imminence of the end was indeed uppermost in his mind. Things are going toward the end. And he added, I hope the last day will not be long delayed, not over a hundred years. Later, in discussing the time of the end, he was impressed that the day of judgment was not far off and that the world could not last 300 years longer. Luther was so impressed by the impending doom that he opined that the end might even come in the midst of the sixth millennium. According to Luther's compu uh, computation, the world was uh, 5,500 years old in the year 1540, which was to be about the right time for the end of all things to occur. While Luther rejected the tendency to set a definite date, he was convinced that there were too many indications in his own time to harbor any doubt as to the approximate time of the end. Quote, now that the end of the world is approaching, he wrote in his preface to the prophet Jeremiah, the people rage, <clears throat> the people rage and, ha and rave most horribly against God and blaspheme and damn God's words. And he concluded, if the last day were not, if the last day were not close at hand, it would be small wonder if heaven and earth were to fall at such blasphemy. The fact that God can tolerate such a thing is uh, as this is a sign that the day is not far off, end quote. He saw yet another sign in the excessive tendency of pleasure-loving generation overindulging in eating and drinking. Luther also thought, uh, also thought uh, the, the gospel was spreading as never before in fulfillment of Matthew 24, uh, verse 14. Uh, and this is, and, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The translation of the Bible into the vernacular, which is Luther's most endearing contribution, hastened, of course, the spreading of the gospel and confirmed him in his beliefs. He was convinced that before the end, the whole world would become Christian. This distress among nations Luther saw as a sign of the end. He said, Wars at the present time are, such, uh, are of such a character as to make former wars appear as a mere child's play. As another sign, he mentions unprecedented storms. There are such storms and tempests and waters rolling um, that have never before been seen or heard. So I'm just going to stop reading this right here because now it goes on about the state of the dead, but we want to focus on, uh, on the seventh day. Uh, or, or, or the Sabbath question, uh, exactly. Um, what do you think of this uh, article so far, Tom? Well, well, I think it's very interesting to read uh, what Martin Luther uh, taught. I would rather read Martin Luther's work for myself rather than someone's representation of what he wrote and said. But 
back to the Sabbath issue, uh, all of these writers, and not just Martin Luther, when the subject of Sunday versus Sabbath is brought up and discussed, they always make a distinction between the Lord's Day and Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And and I cannot find that distinction anywhere in Scripture. Well, if the, Lord, the, the, Lord, the, Lord, the, the Lord's Day and the Sabbath are one and the same day as far as I'm concerned. Well, but they called the Lord's Day Sunday because it was the day of resurrection, right? No, I, I don't believe that at all. I believe the Lord's Day is is direct reference to Sabbath. Yeah, but when you hear the Pope uh, speaking today, when he speaks of the Lord's Day, he speaks about Sunday. Yes, he makes that a distinction. Day. Yeah, yeah that's, that's error. That's error. And Martin Luther makes the same error. And so do all the other uh, uh, writers on this subject. They make a distinction between the Lord's Day and Sabbath. Sabbath was a different day, and it was for the Jews, and the Lord's Day is Sunday, and it's for the Gentiles, which is absolutely not justified in Scripture. I, I'm, I'm saying, and I'll state it again just for clarity, I find no distinction in the Scripture between the Lord's Day and Sabbath. They are one and the same day, and they never changed. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ta- yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, agree with you. I just wanted to mention that, that, for example, the Pope and all these people who are now in this, all these different evangelical Protestant denominations out there and teaching from their pulpits, they are teaching differently. They are saying, right. they are actually saying that the Sabbath day is not important anymore because now we have the Lord's day, which is Sunday, where Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And that is why he wants us, that's how they interpret it, that's yes. how he wants us now to keep Sunday holy because that is when the day when he resurrected. Where yeah, in fact, it, of it, course, the Sabbath day is the Lord's day because that's something that I said in the, in, yeah. in the introduction, Tom. You're absolutely right here. Uh, the Lord uh, invented, let's call it that way, it's easy to see the word that I can use, invented the Sabbath after the creation to put the signature on creation, to say, in six days I made the whole world, and the seventh day I put there for you to rest and to show you that I am the one who created it all. It's like a, 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 an artist who finishes a painting and puts his hand signature mm-hmm. under the painting, that this painting can be associated to someone. The seventh day that God installed uh, after the creation was his signature to remind all mankind for all the time being that the earth is there, to remember the creation that he did in six days and to uh, honest him on the Sabbath day, seventh day that he invented just for that worship and for that rest. And therefore, of course, it is the Lord's day because he invented it therefore. And he also invented the Sabbath for man, not the man for the Sabbath. You just spoke my mind. That's exactly what I believe. There's no difference between the Lord's Day and Sabbath. They are one and the same. It's the seventh day. How Rome and the and even the Protestant reformers made a distinction between Sabbath and the Lord's Day is beyond me. I don't see how they just. I want to see where they try to justify it in the scriptures, because I, I've never read anywhere where they where they showed scriptural evidence for a change between Sabbath and the Lord's Day. I think the scriptures are speaking about one and the same day. And that day is the day that God established on the seventh day of creation. See, they just pull this rabbit out of their hat and expect everybody to follow it. And and Rome even boasts that it was she who changed the Sabbath and that all Protestants follow her authority on it. And I think it's gross error. 
listen, I, I, I could cite you the scripture in Exodus, I believe it's in chapter 30 or 28 or somewhere in there, where, where the Lord says this, he says, Verily, my Sabbath shall ye keep, for it is a sign between thee and me that I am the Lord your God. In other words, we're going to be positively identified as as God's people if we observe his day. Now, you can call it the Lord's day, you can call it Sabbath, you can call it rest, whatever you want to call it. God called it Sabbath, and he called it the seventh day. And the Lord's day is just another way of saying Sabbath. In, in my in my reading of the scriptures, this isn't just my 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 interpretation this is what the scripture says and uh I, I just i just believe i just believe that this is part of the roman leaven that was left behind after the protestant reformation and it has poisoned protestantism and opened the door for ecumenism now the pope can stand on his his pious throne and say there's one thing in which we all agree and we ought to unite on this one issue and put all else aside that's Sunday law and that is Sunday law and that's what's coming and I know I'm not Seventh-day Adventist I'm a Bible believer and uh, you know I'm very passionate about this thing although I am as many of you've already heard, still confused because apparently I haven't thoroughly studied and haven't come to a firm understanding yet on the issue of Sabbath. But well, I hate, I hate, I hate to bring it. Maybe I won't bring it up, but I can tell you, God never changed the Sabbath. And he never did away with it. And he never appointed another day. And he never left it in man's hands to do anything with it except observe it the way he gave it. Now, I'll, I'll just be quiet for a while. If, I, if, if God did do any, if Jesus did anything different with the Sabbath, I want somebody to show me in the scriptures. And Martin Luther's not my authority in determining when the Sabbath is. Neither are any of the other Protestant reformers, because I've said from the get-go, they are the ones responsible for leaving that that germ of of, of Roman leaven in the Protestant lump. I, I absolutely agree with you, Tom, and there's another point that I have uh, been thinking about, and that is co concerning about the founding of uh, the United States of America, 1776, the writing of the Constitution. We all know that we are here to gather, t that we are here gathered together. You all know that in 1776 and uh, in the Constitution, it states in the Constitution, freedom of religion is granted to the peoples who live in the to the people who live in the United States of America at that time. And we all know that when we go into a little bit of research, that this point, freedom of religion, was very important to the Carols, who right. were a very big part in the creation of the United States of America, which is sadly absolutely taken out of every history class ever, told in, uh, ever taught in school, as in university, as wheresoever, because... Yeah, you should better not know who the Carrolls were. They were not important. Well, okay, uh, Charles Carroll was the richest man in the United States at that time anyway. He was the biggest slaveholder, and he was a neighbor of George Washington. I don't, go, I don't go into details right now, but the point that I want to make is, in 1776, you had this inauguration of the Constitution of the United States of America, with in the beginning saying freedom of religion, which opened the door for... Catholics and Jesuits to come over and do their thing, which they were suppressed before in the colonies, because in the colonies no Catholic was allowed to hold office, mass was forbidden, 
celebrating Christmas and all these pagan holidays were forbidden at that time. But that was their door they left open for themselves. And the question that I was asking myself, because I have come across the information that Luther maybe was a Rosicrucian, was that by intent leaving the door of the Sabbath question open, that, like you said, Tom, the Pope has it very easy to say, let's I'll put all differences aside and let's see on what we can concentrate on what we have in common. That is exactly the same thing that was also in the speech with uh, Kenneth Copeland and Tony Palmer, where they interviewed the Pope, where that also came, off, come, c- came on. Let's not see where we are diverted, but let's see what we can agree, and we can agree on the Sunday worship. You is took that the words or he left open? That's the question. You took the words right out of my mouth. I couldn't have said it any better. Thank you. But that that really is the question that we have to ask ourselves. But on the other hand, we are not Luther mockers here. It is not Luther alone. Also, to my knowledge, the other reformists, Tinder, Wycliffe, Huss, Cranmer, um, I can sum them all up, Tom, you know, much more than I do. But also, to my knowledge, they didn't push on the Sabbath keeping. Again, you've taken the words directly out of my mouth. I couldn't say it any better. And I have therefore another... We, uh, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, therefore, Jurgen. We have, therefore, we have, we have to see one thing. We can not forget this. Every reformer came eventually out of the Roman Catholic Church system. Because that was the only system uh, that existed at that time. Roman Catholic law was universal at that time. The Pope, we are speaking about the 1260 years, the reign between 538 and 1798, when the power was given to the dragon. In these dark ages, he had absolute power. So everybody who was then coming to be a reformer came actually out of that system. So we have to consider that everybody who came out of the system was still part of that system. He came from that system. It's the same when you want to say, I want to change the political structure in my country today from within the system. Because that I'm going to vote Ron Paul, or I don't know, any other guy who sits there in the system and says he wants to change the system. This is never going to change. The system can only be changed from the outside and never from the inside. And that is an impact that we probably should consider also when we talk about the reformers. So I'm not Luther bashing, so absolutely not, but it's about all the reformers who missed on this vital point. And you don't have to forget, this is very, very, very easy. But nobody, nobody asks the question, why is that? And, and that's something that bothers me because I'm a relatively new in this Christian movement. I, I'm a relative new, new uh, Jesus follower and Bible follower uh, just for about two years now. Uh, I don't count the days, but, but that's it. And I'm still asking myself these questions, and this is where everything does not make sense. This is why I bring this up. Well, I agree, and I would like to add to all the points that you just made, and that, that was a point that regrettably I failed to make on uh, on uh, Michael's show not long ago when we discussed Romans chapter 13, which the ecumenical evangelibellies used to uh, to uh, teach that we are supposed to unquestioningly uh, obey the civil powers. Right. Hitler even referred to Romans 13 to. Uh, give acknowledgement to his reign. Pardon me? I, I'm sorry? Hitler even quoted Romans 13 to give acknowledgement to his reign. Well, let me... Let me the point that I made uh, later, the next, the next time we got together on, on Michael's program, was the critical portion that I missed in my discussion the previous Thursday... And that is the portion of Scripture in Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Now notice, Rome uh, claims to have authority over God's law. 
And, of course, Rome it uses the civil power. Uh, the civil power is the surrogate of Rome, not the surrogate of God. But the Bible says the civil power is to be a servant of God, not the Pope. And it is supposed to, uh, uh, you know, the civil power does not carry the sword in vain. But what power did God give the civil power? And it says in Romans, 9, in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, here it is for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, that is the second tablet of the law. Mm-hmm. The first tablet of the law is never mentioned in Romans 13. I am the God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and remember the Sabbath day. Those four four commandments... Those the four points that are dealing with the with the relationship that man has with God and that That's God has with men, and the other six points is how men should uh, uh, should uh, deal with men. Uh, I'm sorry you missed that, Tom, but in the beginning we were talking about that, and I I, I said oh. that already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm reiterating something that you've already talked about, and yeah. I'm just, <laughs> and, and and I want to reiterate just for my own satisfaction, if nothing else that the civil power was never given jurisdiction over the first tablet of the law. It's right. out of their jurisdiction. And any time the civil power begins to impose laws or rules and regulations or ordinances having to do with any one of those four points, they are out of order. They are out of God's order. They are out of man's order. And they are to be wholly and completely condemned and resisted. Now, that's precisely what Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, tried to impose upon uh, 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 the Jews. Well, uh, uh, well, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we won't bend. And that's, uh, that's exactly the, ex- the, the uh, example that we are to follow when the civil power of, of either the United States or the Pope that rules all the kings of the earth begins to impose upon us an obligation to observe Sunday. We are to completely stand as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And if we yield on this point, then we have failed to meet the standard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we have, by, by omission, we have given into the Pope's hand or given into the hands of the civil power jurisdiction over the first tablet of the law we have done it and we simply can't obey it that's my heart that's where i stand and that's where i'll die i absolutely agree wayne is there something you want to say well i'm reluctant to say it because i don't want to sow discord I agree with what you have all said, 100%. I will have to imply one thing. We should maybe consider the words, the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is the second coming and the first resurrection. In a lot of places in the Bible where it talks of the Lord's Day, that is what that is being referred to. And again, I do not want to sow discord. I would like to just plant a seed for people to uh, ponder upon that. So when they study and they read, they may keep that in their mind. Well, I think it is absolutely not wrong to say that the day that the Lord comes again, we can call the Lord's Day. As far as the seventh day Sabbath implemented by God Almighty, 
And when they issued the Lord's day. At giving in creation and reapplied to Moses twice, yes, I agree that that is the day of rest. But and when the Lord it? returns, what shall he find you doing? Yep. Resting. Maybe yep. he's coming on a Sabbath. Yep, and we're to look up and be watchful and for his coming. There's no doubt. And the world, certainly, brothers, <laughs> they're looking at anything but that. You know, they're watching who's quarterback in the football game today and how cold the beer is. So, I, It sounds to me like we are all essentially on the same page on this. Yep. Sabbath issue. Yep. Well, look at that. That's just a question that I brought up in this one broadcast that I had with Michael, and uh, I was quite sure that you guys were on my side, but that's only because I know your standpoint on the on the Bible and on prophecy and 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 uh, on the Word of God generally. I thought that uh, that we <clears throat> when we are doing this broadcast, it was uh, not to that we discuss one each other with different opinions because we don't have opinions. We base the things that we say on this broadcast on facts. Right. On facts that we can prove in the scripture right. because the scripture is there to prove and reprove. And that's what you guys do. But I am not that far literature in the Bible that I wanted to do this alone, so I needed a little bit of your wisdom. Uh, to bring into this broadcast, and that's why I thank you both for, for being here and contributing, uh, contributing to this. But the most important thing for me was that we could have a message that we can bring out to the people who are listening now and who will in the, in the future probably listen to this online or even download this broadcast to get an understanding that you don't have to join any congregation and surely not the Seventh-day Adventists to be a real, true follower of the word of Jesus Christ and all his commandments, which include the fourth commandment of remembering the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Yeah. Agreed. This is the message that I want to bring out because there are so many Christians out there who say, I'm such a good person and I do good in this and I do good in that and I pray here and I pray there and I have this and I have that. But on Saturday I just do this and on Sunday I go worship in the church. These are all betrayed souls. And when the shit hits the fan, as they call it, when the Lord comes, you, would say, you say, Lord, Lord, and I have never known you. Mm -hmm. Right, brother. Mm -hmm. And it is a little bit of my idea, and I guess yours too, that's why you are here, that we want to save souls from false teachings that is all around us. Agreed. And That's even on the internet with the alternative media, you come into so much deception and disinfo that the only thing you can put there at the basis of your study is the Holy Bible, the Word of God. And for people who have doubt, please look at Matthew chapter 24. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So if the Sabbath day has been disregarded and thrown away, why would the Messiah say these words? And it is a glimpse of the eternal Sabbath as well as the millennial Sabbath. And people don't ever put the three pieces together. But I assure you, you read Isaiah 66, and it's right there perfectly clear. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should, be, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Matthew 24, 20-22. Right. Okay, now we have been a little bit uh, discussing why we're doing this broadcast, what is the basis on this broadcast. Now I, 
uh, if you guys are okay with it, I found another article that I really want to read that is called Why the Protestant Reformation Failed. Well, I don't agree and, with that uh, title, that's for sure. They didn't fail. God's hand certainly was upon it. Yeah. Okay. But we can... <laughs> I cannot change the title of this article, but I can say, why didn't the reformers go all the way? Well, I, I've even said with my own mouth, you know, chastise me if I'm wrong, but certainly in, at least in comparison to 1517 AD and and the and the 100 years immediately following it if you if you compare protestantism today with the protestantism of that era it has failed miserably oh, no <laughs> it's almost non-existent yeah, yeah yes and you know why yeah, you know I, know why? Why. I know why. Because, I know why. Because they didn't go on the Sabbath issue. Because if all the reformers at that time would have taught from their pulpits and in their communities and to their flocks, to everybody, to every reborn Christian at that time, to everybody who could hold the Bible and read it in their own words, in their own language at that time, and put the emphasis on keeping the Sabbath, Rome would have very, very difficult work to do today. Again, you take the words that's, right out of my mouth. That, that's, from, that's what I meant when, when, when a little bit earlier I, I, I made the comparison with 1776. The door they let open there in 1776 for the freedom of religion to let the Roman Catholic Church have an entering into the United States of America that was formerly completely Protestant, with the, the same action you have here because the reformers did not push all the way to the Sabbath keeping and therefore Rome has an easy way because there is almost nobody here who keeps the Sabbath right now. What are the only people that the Roman Catholic Church has to, um, has to cope with? Seventh-day Adventists. And Seventh-day Baptists. Yeah, there is a small section of Seventh-day Baptists. Yeah. And oh, Jews. even the even the Jews are capitulating, uh, if, if so my source is correct. Jews in New York already, in, in, in New York, at synagogue, where they already keep the Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, well yeah. I'd like to, you're right again, again, Tom, and I will tell you one other thing. Before I left Florida and come here, in the little town that I lived in, there was a Catholic church on Main Street, of course, hello. And they had on the very front of the, uh, I don't know, little billboard deal out in the front. Oh, yeah, that they worship on Sabbath now. Now you tell me what that's leading to. The Catholic You're going to call Church. Sunday the Sabbath. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh boy, I tell you. It's so bad. we worship we worship Sabbath, but it's just another day, right? That, that, that is just like in the article that I just read, uh, where also Luther said uh, that uh, you, you can worship any other day. That was quite in the beginning of the article, right? Right. Yeah. You remember the Messiah? The Messiah said, "If you break the least of these commandments, you break them all." So a person oh, yeah. not honoring the Sabbath is breaking the commandments, of course, and they're going to be led into further darkness all along every day. I believe that. Uh, Wayne, it's very easy. The transgression of the law is sin. That's right, and the wage of sin is death. That's right, and the wage of sin is death. Voila. So it doesn't matter if you break the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth, or tenth. Yep. Whichever commandment you break, you are sinning. Uh, when you do it willingly, no. there is nobody being punished for breaking one of the commandments if he is not aware of them. And that teaching is also in the Bible. Uh, I think that is in the New Testament. Um, I don't know who said it. I think it is uh, John. In, in John that the stated that I, I, I didn't know the law uh, for, for I couldn't transgress the law but when I know the law I can transgress it and then I have to be punished of course I, I think that it's somewhere in John you cannot be punished for something that you don't that you are not aware about right but from there's the moment people, that you are aware, Messiah made the statement that there's people out here that keep the commandments and they don't even know it the way they live their life yeah because 
you know, this, this moral is given us by God uh, yes. when we are born. This That's is right. just natural reaction. Right. You know? right. Yep. Yeah. That's why when you give a little, uh, when you give a baby of a year or two, uh, of two years old, for example, uh, and you give him a carrot and a rabbit, he will not eat the rabbit and play with the carrot, but eat the carrot and play with the rabbit. Yerk, I don't want to disrupt your discussion. I want your discussion to continue as you've had it laid out. But if there's time, I want to relate a short story that I, a ch experience I had on amateur radio regarding the Sabbath, just to demonstrate, just to demonstrate the rank hypocrisy and and the blindness when it comes to this subject of the Sabbath. It it'll just blow your mind. It, Please it's come share with us. Oh, you ready now? Yeah, okay. absolutely. I, I was starting. I was starting reading the other article. I do that after that. What uh, what you're intervening right now? No problem. Okay. Please this, go ahead. This is an incredible story, and I won't try to drag it out and dramatize it. I'll just tell you what happened. I was in a discussion with uh, a, a, a Lutheran of the Missouri Synod, I believe, and then a theologian. Uh, I could give you their names and call signs, but it wouldn't matter anyway. I, we were discussing uh, the law, and I, I pointed out to them that the Roman Catholic Church had completely eliminated the, set, the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And, of course, they all know that there are images and idols all throughout the Catholic churches. I mean, it's a, it's a church of idolatry. <clears throat> and uh, so they were condemning the, the, the Roman Catholic Church for having the brazen audacity, the blasphemous audacity to completely erase one of God's laws. Just, just, just by fiat, strike the second commandment. And then to cover up their tracks, to split the tenth commandment, that having to do with covetousness, into two to to make up the ten, instead of nine commandments, they just split the tenth and made it two, so the number is ten. And at the reason, and I just I kept you know encouraging them. What do you, what do you think of the you know and just and boy they really piled on that stuff. We were all on the same page, you know. And after I. I I kept the hype up about the brazen, blasphemous audacity of the Roman Catholic Church to think to change God's law. What about the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, neither thou nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy ox, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in the And the seventh day he rested and made it holy. What about that one? Who changed that one? Well, now you're Judaizing. And I mean the hatred come out of those two and they lambasted me, and I, I, absolutely, they waged, they've waged war on me ever since that day. You see, they had no problem condemning as diabolical the Roman Catholic Church for striking the Second Commandment. But they were ready to go to war when I pointed out that they change the fourth one. And they absolutely have stuck to their guns. And you can't, when it comes to this subject of the Sabbath, you simply cannot break the blindness. It's got to be God that does it. And they made every excuse in the world. Well, I can keep any day I want, and uh, that was just for the Jews, and when I reminded them, no, 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 that was on the seventh day of creation. There wasn't no such thing as a Jew. There was only Adam and Eve. 
That law was for all of mankind, all of mankind. Every product of the loins of Adam and Eve was to be subject to the law, the Sabbath law, the first law. That's why God, you know, when he wrote it in tables of stone, the first word of his mouth was, remember the Sabbath day. And I'm telling you, the longer I talk, the more venomous and vindictive and accusatory and slanderous those people became. And I'm sure each and every one of you, or who you are, who have taken up this Sabbath issue with, with, with the Sunday keepers, have experienced the same vitriolic response. But I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's become one of the most enjoyable things I do on ham radio is to get somebody to start talking about how brazenly, blasphemously the Roman Catholic Church eliminated the Second Commandment. And when they've, when they've drawn their last drop of blood skewering the Roman Catholic Church for changing this or for eliminating the Second Commandment, then I tell them about the fourth one. You know why the people have such a hard time with the Sabbath? Because of convenience sake, just like the clean and unclean meats. It's not convenient for them. It's not pleasant to them. It gets in their way of the order of their life, so they just disobey with it. Well, they all but called me Antichrist, boy. Mm-hmm. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I've experienced that many times myself. Well, I'm sure you have. I'm, I'm sure there was nothing about that story that was really even new to you guys. Oh, no, but it's good for the listeners to give them the thought, you know. I think the show is great. It's I a, think the people need to hear the truth. Their pastors don't teach them the truth, that's for sure. It has made the same mistake all over again, just in the article that I read before, when Luther uh, connected the Sabbath to the Jews. The Jews are just one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and Israel has been given the commandments of God at Mount Sinai, not the Great Jews. Great point. Fantastic point. And they so fell back really into the sun worship just... over and over and over and over. They continually fell back into sun worship. Now, And this, this whole discussion about this Israel today, that is exactly the same point. They are always talking about the Jews living in that country of Israel. Oh. Israel is not a piece of dirt somewhere on the earth. Israel is God obeying people. Boy, what understanding. What great understanding. Praise the Lord. When I read the Old Testament, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure right now that I can make the, the right point, but there's one point where God says, your name shall not be, what was it, uh, Yo- Yo- uh, Joshua anymore? Was it Joshua or what? It shall be Israel? Jacob. Uh, Jacob, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Jacob. Your, sh- your, your name shall not be Jacob, Jacob anymore. Your name shall be Israel, and I will make of you many people. I mean, okay. everybody who reads the Bible who under, understands the question of Israel. I don't know why there is such this 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 piece of dirt there in, 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 this, uh, in the east that they call Israel today, and putting it with uh, so-called Jews, where there is another question: What kind of Jews are they? Because you have two kinds of Jews. You have first and for all the real descendants of the tribe of Judah, who were Jews, who are Jews by blood but you also have Jews who convert to the Judaic belief system. The Abrahamic belief system. Or the Abrahamic belief system, but who, who convert so-called to Judaism, you know? You have that a lot of, in, in the United States of America, for example, there's a lot of uh, examples in movies and all that stuff. Uh, when you go to, the, to marry a Jew, okay, I convert to Jewism, uh, Judaism, uh, or... or or whatever you want to call it, I convert to that, but that doesn't change my blood. Yeah. So there's two, type, two types of, of, yeah. of Jews. There's this uh, religious Jews, meaning following the religion of the Jews, and there is yeah. this real blood Jews. 
Now I have a critical point to make on this on this count, uh, Yerk. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Judea, the Jewish religion, Judaism, is not the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and we have to be very careful not to fall into the trap that Rome has set for us in calling the true religion of Jesus Christ, the true faith of Jesus Christ, as Judeo-Christianity. That is apostasy. Judaism, look, the Jews were sent into Babylonian captivity because they worshipped like the Babylonians. Yep, sun worship. Yep. Judaism, yeah. Judaism is apostasy. Judaism has already been condemned by God. The Jews were sent to Babylonian captivity to make up their mind whether they were going to worship the God of the Babylonians, as Mike Mike calls it, sun worship, or whether they were going to serve the living God. And we know who served the living God in Babylon. It was Abra- it was it was it was uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The rest of them bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar's image. Right. Every time they played that music, boom, they bowed. Yep. That's right. Yep. We are not Judeo Christians. No. No. To no. be a Judeo Christian is to be a Roman Catholic. Yep. Sun worshiper. There's a reason why the Pope wears a yarmulke. Okay, it's 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 the synagogue of Satan is made up of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jews, the Christ rejecting Jews that now occupy that sliver of land that the world calls Israel. Hundred percent agreement, brother. And I've said that a hundred times. Our God said to him to worship not with your head covered, pray with your head not covered, because yeah. for a woman it glorifies her, but a man it shames him. And have long hair. And you look at these people, they wear them little beanie hats. Yep. That's an abomination to God in its own. And they pray to a piece of stone, and they put a piece of paper and a stone, and they kneel down to it? Are you serious? Let's call a spade a spade. Jesus, when he walked the streets of Jerusalem, had a controversy. A uh, 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 a make or break controversy with Judaism. Yep. And he called them a den of vipers. Yes. He said, You are of your father the devil. And Wait. Judaism was mixed up with Kabbalah, it was mixed up with the Babylonian Talmud, it was mixed up with with Gnosticism. all kinds, all kinds of perversion. Yeah, That's why Jesus had a controversy with the religious leaders of his day. We're not to be a part of anything called Judaism. Okay. And, no, and that, that, that's a point that is so rarely made, and people out of ignorance say, well, I'm a Judeo-Christian. Well, they, if they understand what they've said, they've condemned themselves. Out. They've absolutely wholly condemned themselves. Messiah called them whited sepulchers, you know, full of dead man's bones. Well, I would never call myself a today Christian. I would call myself an Israelite of anything. Absolutely. Uh, Praise God. That's what we are, Israelites. Spiritual but true Israelites. Israelites. Absolutely. Yeah, point, thank you. But, but the point that I was making is that in our society where we live in today, it is so easy um, to deceive the people with this word Jews, you know. Israel, that piece of land there, uh, Jerusalem, that, that part of the earth, is filled with so-called Jews. And I just wanted to make the distinction, well, that Israel is actually a nation of God's obedient people and not a piece of dirt somewhere. And this is now occupied by the Jews, but the Jews are only one of the 12 tribes of this Israel. And still then, you have to make the distinction between the Jews who are Jews by blood descendants of the tribe of Judah from the old times, and the people who, for ever what reason, convert to to the Judaic belief system and are called Jews. That was the only point that I was making, so... 
Oh, yes, but, but you just reminded me of something that needs to be, the listeners need to hear. Absolutely, yeah. It's a very important point, critical point. I, I agree with you, Tom. I think I've never disagreed with you on anything. <laughs> Just because we have both uh, quite a fine understanding of the Scripture, yeah. Well, the Spirit has only one message, and it's the truth. Yep. And, uh, and, yep. and all of the errors that are available in the world today are judged by that one truth. And, and so it, it shouldn't surprise either you or me that when I hear you talk, I hear my own heart. And when I talk, you hear my own heart. Same yes, spirit. Have, <laughs> the, the spirit is the same, but I don't have that uh, wonderful background uh, that you're having of years of uh, reading uh, great books, giving you a lot of uh, wisdom and understand, much more understanding than me, who is just a baby Christian, you know, with the last two years. So I'm, I'm just busy. But in, in, in discussions like this, or in, this, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in conversations like this, I really see that uh, it must be the Holy Spirit leading my words because I can make that up for myself. And Isn't that, that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that God that's... leads us in ways that we cannot deceive ourselves in thinking that we came up with it within ourselves. No, the spirit of truth leads us in all truth, just like it says. You know, it's not of us. At least that's we right. Boast, just like it says, we would boast. And that's pride, and that's Satan, and that's mankind. So, Man has philosophy. And without the word of God, all it is is philosophy. And without that, it don't amount to squat. So. Okay, I still have this article prepared to read why the Protestant Reformation failed or why the Protestant Reformation didn't go all the way. Are you guys interested in, uh, in listening? Oh, absolutely. Okay, because I'm looking forward to reading it. And we can keep our discussion, our, our conversation with this. So please, uh, Tom... Wayne, when I read something and you say, well, I have to interrupt here because otherwise I lose my point, uh, interrupt me then, all right? Okay. And otherwise we will uh, start our conversation again at the end of the reading. So the article is called Why the Protestant Reformation Failed. And I start with a few quotes from the Bible. Revelation 22, uh, chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Seeing that, you have, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, is your that God? what it says? Yes, the yeah. law. Seeing that you it, have forgotten, forgotten the law of your God, yes. I will yes. also forget your children. Okay, continue. And uh, Revelation 14, verse 12, <clears throat> Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Yeshua. The commandments. You know, and the whole Christian world says God's law is dead crucified with Christ. We are under grace now. And they and by that saying alone, they make Christ the minister of unrighteousness. They say God's law is dead, but the trouble is, in the Christian world today, they make no distinction between the, 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 the commandments of God that were written on stone, not once but twice by the very finger of God himself, and the ceremonial law that was that was written on parchment or was written on skins and and placed in the side of the ark rather than inside the ark where the where the, where the, where the law was yeah and it is that law that ceremonial law that Christ fulfilled that was a a a a, a temporary teacher until that which is more perfect had come they want to say that when that law that was that was that was crucified with Christ, it was that law that was crucified with Christ, fulfilled yeah, because by Christ. Perfectly he shed, his, 
he shed yes, his blood. He shed his blood. And, and blood shedding was the the, uh, the traditional, uh, the ceremonial law they had because it was um, the offering of sins and uh, uh, and all these different offerings. There were all blood uh, blood offers that were brought, and yes. that is why Jesus had to shed his blood for yes. all of us. Of course, yes. that's the point. Yeah, yeah. And this same group of people that 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 said. You know, when when we concluded our, our our vitriolic discussion about the Ten Commandments, uh, particularly about the Second Commandment, which the Roman Catholic Church brazenly omitted, and the Fourth Commandment, which they brazenly omit or change, if that's more correct phraseology, then they started to tell me, having failed all in all of their other arguments about the Sabbath day, then they resorted to saying the law is dead. Galatians chapter 3. It's crucified with Christ. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. And then, I didn't tell the whole story, I guess. I said, well, then, if that law is dead, then you wouldn't mind me sleeping with your wife tonight. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That law is dead, so you wouldn't mind loaning me your wife tonight, would you? Now, I'm sorry to be so crude, but I had to make a point to people who were just willfully blind. And, and, and well, of course not. Well, then, you would, if this law is dead, then you wouldn't mind seeing me bowing down and worshiping images and idols then, would you? Or you wouldn't, you wouldn't condemn me for worshiping another god, the one that did not bring us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, would you? Of course, we already know what you think, think about the Sabbath. You know, that's any day or every day or whatever day, you know, to you. But, 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 but what about taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain? What if I started punctuating everything I said with Jesus Christ? I mean, look, we can go, we can go through all ten of these. If I murdered somebody, if I bore false witness, if, if I coveted, them. you would condemn me, even though out of the other side of your mouth you say, judge not that you be not judged, you would condemn me for violating any one of those Ten Commandments except the Fourth Commandment. And yet, on the other side of your mouth, as if your mouth were, had, was an octagon, you have so many sides of your mouth you can't even count them all, you would condemn me for violating any one of these laws, so at the same time, in the same breath, tell me this law is dead. You people cannot be, you cannot be serious. You are so deluded that you can contradict yourself in the very same sentence. Where is the sanity? And I told them, the error that you make is a failure to understand that there were two laws given. That which was written in stone by the very finger of God and placed inside the ark, and that which was written on tables of skins that were rolled up as a scroll and put in the side of the ark. Exactly. The how, can, how, how in Christ's name can you tell me, you know, I'm talking to these people, how in Christ's name can you tell me God's law is dead and then condemn me for telling a lie or sleeping with your wife or stealing or murdering or worshiping an image or an idol? You are so deluded you can't even see the light of day. And that goes for the whole Christian world today. Yep. Absolutely. Well, you see, they follow Satan's law, do what thou will. So there you go. That's exactly it, Michael. Do what thou wilt is the whole of their law. And how dare they call themselves Christians? Right. Is that not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain? Yep. Sure is. That's, That's what an it is. It's an abomination, brother. It's an abomination. It is. It is. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, as much as it may seem, but I hate to be around them. And I talked to Walter about this time and again. I hate, you know, I'm in treatment and I'm not going to go in about my problems. 
But I hate even going out there driving amongst them because they're like they're all medicated out here, honestly. And it's not a cold heart that I've got. It's like they don't even know where they're at. It's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. I love my quietness where I'm at. I'll tell you that. Believe me. And I'm thankful to God every day for it. Believe me, I am. I'm sorry, Yerk. I I really get really loaded up on this subject. No, no, uh, no problem. No problem, Tom. We we discussed the same point a little bit earlier already, as you remember. Uh, I, I, uh, I said the same point some time ago where you said that's absolutely right. And now you brought it up again. But it cannot be brought up enough. You know, it's, it is such an important point we can really um, repeat sometimes. And uh, right, that, that is, uh, like, like Jesus said, he, he didn't come to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And yeah. there, is, there is everything said with. He fulfilled the law of the blood sacrifice, but he didn't abolish the moral law. Which and, is, uh, yes, yes, what made him... It's yes. the basis of our society. If, if everybody, if everybody could, could 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 steal and kill and lie and do anything, well, then we are absolutely in yeah, what most people would call anarchy. Yes, godless. Because there is no godless. law. Godless. Godless. Yeah, that's the word. Godless. godless. Yeah. Dirk, you you said that sin is the violation of the law. Right. You said it yourself. If there is no law, there is no sin. And isn't that what the church believes today? That the yep. law is dead, crucified with Christ, yep. so that they can, so that they're under grace and they can sin all their life. And you, and you and know, they, and, and in you know, so doing, and in so doing, they make Christ the minister of unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And you know, it fits with that, brother. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That same as same as uh, what you said before. Do that's what right. thou wilt is the whole of the law, and then you yep. die like a dog. Yep, that's right, brother. Just um, you almost answered the question that was uh, made here by um, uh, Shadow Girl. She asked here in uh, in our call. God made people with different IQs, therefore different levels of being able to understand. If someone never knows, for whatever reason, that the Sabbath is not on Sunday, but Saturday, how can God hold them responsible for that? Now, I think, Shadow Girl, that has been answered right now, where Tom said it now, and I said it already earlier in this time, that when you are not aware of that there is a law, you cannot break the law. You can only break the law when you are aware of it. And God will punish everybody who is following his law and then willingly transgresses one or more of his laws given. Willingly transgresses. And then transgression of the law, the punishment, therefore, is, uh, is a sin, and the wager of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We cannot, we have to be careful. I don't believe, I think we have to be careful not to make the same mistake as the Seventh-day Adventists and make Sabbath-breaking a salvific issue. The Bible says all sins may be forgiven of man, except the, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven in this life nor the life to come. Now, that moral law, those Ten Commandments, we violate every one of them. And because we violate them, knowingly and unknowingly, that, ca- that creates for us a need for a Savior. The law, the Ten Commandments, cannot save us. It can only condemn us. And because we recognize through the law and examining examining ourselves according to that law, we realize that we've fallen short of the mark. And that leads us to Christ. Now, if it were not for that law, we would have no need for Christ because there would be no sin for him to die for. When When the blind, deaf, and dumb Christians say that that law is dead, they virtually eliminate the need for Christ, and Christ died in vain yep. because Christ died to remit our sins. Well, sins are the violation of the law. So what do they do? They just 
just dispense with the law. And when they do, they dispense with Christ too. Right. And Christ died in vain. I mean, it's so common sense, but you can't talk common sense to those who are so deeply deluded. Now, if we've never known the Sabbath. We have God's grace. We have Christ's blood. If he is our Savior, he died for our sins, all of them, even Sabbath-breaking. But now we know what day is the Sabbath, don't we? Yep. We're unanimous on this count. Absolutely. It's the seventh day. And that and that has been consecutive since creation. Regardless of their chants and squirmishes about them changing the calendars and this and that, who cares what they've done? The seventh, the seventh, the seventh, the seventh is consecutive and never changed impossible to change so now that we're under grace shall we sin that god grace forbid. may abound god forbid. god forbid but go on to perfection and that's what we have to do the protestant reformers did not go on to perfection god wants perfection from us he wants us to acknowledge him and he wants us to acknowledge his sabbath his day of rest because you know what it's prophetic the seventh day the, the day that God set aside as hallowed is representative of that Sabbath rest that is coming for all of God's people who now labor under the torments of Satan. And when he's bound in chains for a thousand years, the Scripture says, we'll not be laboring under his torments. Nope. Everything will be provided for us. He'll, in the he'll keep the Sabbath, too, for that thousand years. That's right, and not even the land will be killed for a thousand years, it will, and the right. earth and the earth shall finally enjoy all of her sabbaths. God no one is going to. You know no that. one. No one is ever going to set aside God's Sabbath day. No one. No. No. God's got a record in heaven of every year that the land was tilled when it should have lied fallow. God's got a record, and He's going to make it up to the earth. Yeah, he will. Isaiah 66 tells you there is an eternal Sabbath, like I've stated before. And so, so each week, each seventh day, we should have it in our minds that it is just a foretaste, a weekly foretaste of what God has in store for all of his people. That is the true keeping of the Sabbath. And in it, there won't be any television. There won't be any misinformation or disinformation. We won't be out tilling the soil because we'll be eating of the tree of of life freely. Uh, Everything will be provided for us, even our dwellings. Yep. That's what it says. And one thing I'd really like to bring a point to also, again, that I brought up with Michael, is the discussion that there won't be any sun. Why do they call it the solar system? Whose system is it? God's? Yes. God, it ain't God's system, brother. No, it's not. The Baal, the Baal worshipers worship the sun. Yes, the Muslims worship the moon. They've always worshipped the creation. Every pagan religion in the world worships the creation. And guess what? The two most popular false gods are the sun and the moon. And guess what? When Christ says the sun will not shine and the earth and the moon shall not give her light, for Christ shall be the light thereof. Praise Praise God. God, Yeah, praise God, brother. (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad. All the the false gods will be done away with. All the false gods will be done away with. Praise his holy name. We're on the same page, brother. Believe me. Boy, Yerk, you stirred up something in me. (laughs) That was my idea, Tom. That was my idea, to get you guys here and uh, to really share this wonderful, great package of knowledge and years of studying the Bible and interesting books with the truth in it and sharing it with the people that we have the opportunity to do via the Internet right now. 
and maybe to reach even one or two persons to give them the understanding that you guys have and that I try to obtain with my studies and to see that life is more than just in the morning getting up, going to work and treading in the hamster wheel and going home and sitting in front of the TV and get brainwashed by mainstream media information and Hollywood movies and TV series and all that stuff that take us away from what life is really all about. Life is a test. God put us here to test us worthy for eternal life. Mm. That's my understanding of life. That's it. And someone has 20 years and the other one has 100 years. Someone with 20 can reach heaven and someone with 100 cannot, even though he has five times the chance. But the problem is the knowledge the people are going to gather to gay, and this is not real knowledge, but that is what is more convenience. Life has to be convenient. And by that, I guess I go back a little bit to the uh, Sabbath question. Because for a lot of people, it is not convenient to keep the Sabbath. What, is, what does the Bible say is the whole duty of man? Michael, it's right on the tip of your tongue. Indeed it is right now. and it's, I, I even have that written in my Bible right on the back pages. <laughs> it's in Ecclesiastics, if I remember, isn't it not? Um, I'm I'm not sure. Old duty man. Yep. Love God and keep His commandments. That is the whole duty of man. It all it always comes back to the commandments, doesn't it? It's it's a little bit about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has mm-hmm. only two commandments. Love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that is the two tables of the law. The first table had to do with man's responsibility to God, and the second tablet had to do with man's responsibility to man. Absolutely. He, in, two, in two laws, he, he reiterated, he restated all ten of the... The Ten Commandments. Yep. There you go, Yerk. Absolutely. And this is totally missed by Christianity today. Totally missed. Right. They use that scripture, that very scripture, to nullify the Ten Commandments. Isn't that amazing? When it is nothing but a restatement of the Ten Commandments. It's a reiteration of the Ten Commandments. Why did Paul say, little children, keep you from idols. Keep yourself from idols. Well, he was just restating the Second Commandment. As he restated all of the Ten Commandments. And yet the whole and I use the term advisedly, the universal church of Jesus Christ on this earth condemns the Ten Commandments. Isn't that amazing? That which calls itself the church of Jesus Christ makes it a matter of, of doctrine that the Ten Commandments are dead. I was correct. It is in the book of Ecclesiastics. It's chapter 12, verse 13. It says, let us hear the whole conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Without the law, there's no distinction of good or evil. And I believe so with the, the law, God God living in the world of evolution. Those that say that the law is dead have just dug up the entire foundation of the Christian religion.
They've dispensed with the law, and they've likewise dispensed with Christ, and they have no faith at all. Well, Tom, this is exactly why they push this agenda and this teaching of the evolutional theory of the people. Exactly, Yerk. Because when you all just come from a stone where millions of years of rain suddenly, by accident, life came out of, and all life on Earth can be traced back to that, that means that you are not a god. To a banana, like you are to an ape, like you are to a fish, like you are to. Um, the plant that you are having in your living room, because you all come from the same, where does then moral law come from? Because you only can depend on survival of the fittest. How can the fittest survive? By killing the not-so-fit, yeah. right? Yeah. The ones where is the moral in there? Where is the moral in there? Yeah. And that's why they teach this evolution yep. on our children away from the Bible, and the only thing they teach is humanism and human rights yeah. to free man. But what they don't tell you is that they only want to free man from the, God of law, from, from the law of God. Yep. They want to free man from God. And I, I, I really have to say this right now. This is one of the best quotes that I've ever heard from Bill Cooper. When he started his Mystery Babylon series, he told me and he, he, he said an explanation of how this Kabbalists, how this evil Sunday worshippers and, and even Baal worshippers and sun lovers, how do they think? He said, these people in Freemasonry, these people in the secret societies, these so-called illuminated ones, they teach that God held Adam and Eve in prison in the Garden of Eden because he was a cruel and vindictive God and he wanted to keep people, mankind, stupid. And by giving the light of knowledge to men, Satan freed man from the bondage and the law of God. That's exactly what Bill Cooper said. I Bill, just, Bill, no. Bill Cooper was ignorant about a lot of things, but Bill oh, Cooper, yeah. Bill Cooper uh, said it like it is. Yeah. That's why in, his, was, in, his, in his heart of hearts, he had to know the Savior. You know, I have to say something. William Cooper put in my mind many, many years ago the word amen, and I never got what he was talking about. You know, it it hit me, but it didn't. And 20 years later, I moved to Florida, and long story short, very short, we went to this little theme park, and it was not Disney because I refused to take my children to Disney World. It was a little water theme park, and long story short, I walked into the center of this building, and there's like a pole with aquariums in it, and it's holding this building up, whatever, whatever. On this pole, there's nothing but pictures of Amun-Ra, sun worship, from Egypt. And that's where I was led when I walked into this place. And it like the light switch went on. And just for anybody who might be interested in information here, I've received two books from Ireland proving that the words, so be it, were originally in the Bible, and at least goes back to the books in my hands until the 13th century, 14th century, and 15th century. And they have changed this to Amen. So, and again, I ask anyone, like Cooper stated, who are you worshiping at the end of your prayer when you say Amen? And yes, it offends so many out here. I had uh, libraries and geologists and on and on and on, people that even in Aramaic rewrote the Bible in the original language, and they none would touch this. Like you got the plague. So I just wanted to bring that out. I thought it was important, and I give credit to Cooper for that. Of course, the Holy Spirit. Well, 
Michael, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll go where even angels fear to tread. Uh, I've wrestled with this for a long time. And uh, I see it potentially, and I use the term potentially for a reason. I, use, I see it as potentially a discredit of the King James Bible. And that plays into Satan and Rome's hands, too. Now, I've heard other people wrestle with this. And Nicholas from First Amendment Radio says that Amen is just the translator's way of saying Amen, which was a British word, and he gave the British meaning of it. And, and he he seems to indicate that it's a coincidental likeness of the uh, Egyptian, the name of the Egyptian god Amun-Ra. And, and he understands what Bill Cooper said, just like you do. And, uh, but he had reservations that it might have been just Satan's way of discrediting the King James Bible, because the King James Bible has that word throughout the New Testament after every prayer. I agree with that, but you got to understand, this come from Egypt long before the King James Bible. And in Greece, they, rep- they represented that with the word Amun. And Ament was the female cohort. So, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I try not to make it too much of a controversy yeah. because it discredits the King James Bible. And I have to believe uh, that God preserved his word. And if it's not the King James Bible, I don't know what it is. I mean, look, well, it's, you know, we're getting way off the subject, but yeah, but, but let me let me interject one thing here, Tom, and uh, that's maybe something to think about. Amen is not only in the King James Bible; Amen is in every Bible. And as we all have learned by the way that we did our studies already, the majority is always wrong, isn't it? There is. If so when you go with the majority to say amen to finish your prayers, that doesn't necessarily have to be right or that has to be wrong. I think for my part, as far as I understand it, if I had a doubt on that, I have an opportunity to take a, an alternative. Yeah, it's also in the Geneva Bible, yeah. Um, and the alternative is just to thank God for listening to my prayer by saying, thank you, Father. Yep, that's what I say. Yep. Or to say, so be it. In Yeshua's name. Thank you, Father. Yep. And the same, the same question, and thank you for bringing up the name of Yeshua, Wayne. That's the same point. There are people who say you have to say Yeshua, and you have to say Yahweh, and Yahuwah, and I don't know, and all that stuff. And then Jesus, and Jesus is a Roman name. Jesus, and in German, you have a Jesus Christ, Jesus Christus. Uh, the ending of U.S. that is Roman and that is this and that is that. I think that when I address my Lord and I speak from my heart and I know the name that I use, uh, I, I use the name that I know, sorry, <laughs> I use the name that I know, then he will understand me. Whether I say Jesus or say Yeshua or whatever. I mean, Yeshua is, that is the uh, Aramaic name. I, I, I get that. But that's the same, like, in in all languages, things have other names. And people have other names. People's names are other written. Look, for example, a nice example that I can tell you is about Gorbachev. You you write that different in German than you do it in Russian, than you do it in English. They all write it in the same name. So... Well, I've fallen into the trap, too, of uh, insisting that the Jewish name of Jesus was Yahushua, or permutations of it. And I referred to Jesus for a long time as Yahushua. Uh, But I've been admonished that when I do that, I discredit the King James Bible interpreters. And if we believe that God has preserved his word, his pristine word of God, 
that he must have used the British interpreters of the scriptures into English and transliterated Jesus' Hebrew name to Jesus. And if I, if I discredit Jesus as the authentic name of my Savior, then I've discredited the King James Bible. And I've been, I've been roundly chastised for that. And, and so I use the word Jesus. Yeah, me too. Because yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But I, I have my doubts on the word amen, and that's why I don't use amen. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have no I, doubts on Jesus, but I have my doubts on Amen to make that clear. That's just my point. Yeah. Well, I've had 59 years of conditioning to use the word Amen, and it comes out occasionally, but I choke on it every time I use it. <laughs> well, so that doesn't give you the best of feelings. No, it doesn't. So that should raise a question. And, you know, like I said, when we know that the majority is always wrong, why then following the majority who says amen? It has to be wrong because the majority does it, you know? Yep. But what do I say to those people but what do I say to those people who say that when you refuse to use the word amen, you're discrediting the King James Bible? What do I say to those people? Well I say this man interpreted the Bible. Yes, the Holy Spirit led it. No, I don't want to get into a controversy or separation over it. But I know, for an example, Zondervan, King James Bible, Jesuits. So, you know, I don't know. You know. Well, I was anyway planning um, to talk to Michael about making another broadcast because last time... I read something about the Geneva Bible, and the, uh, I wanted to suggest to him that we make my next conversation with Jogler, or the one that follows the next one, uh, about the discussion on the on the Bible, on the King James or the Geneva of 1599, for example. That can be very interesting. But yeah, well, the, that's for fine. The moment, for the moment, I have to say, we are really a little bit off the subject, because we were discussing how did the reformers see the Sabbath day, and I have prepared an article that I really would like to read. <laughs> yes, please do. Please do. I, we, I, love, we, I, I love our conversation that we have here. Don't get me wrong, because um, this is really good, and this has, to, this has to go out. And this is, you know, we, we are working here without any transcripts or whatever. We just go along. Uh, we make along as we go along, and we speak from our hearts. And... Um, but, but sometimes I, I think that we have to go back to this one and then we can discuss this and uh, we can go on all night if you want to. <laughs> if it's all right, I'm going to continue reading. Is that all right with everyone? Please. Before you do, give me a, a three-minute break. I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. Well, I'd like, you, I'd, like, yeah, I'd like to make a few comments. So. Well, first of all, folks, for those who are listening and those well, who are listening... just because this is your show, you can't make comments, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, just joking know, with you, brother. I'm going to go get me I a bottle of tea real quick. Thank you. I, I understand that. So, But, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, pretty much for the folks who are listening. So, but um, uh, I really am enjoying this. This past couple hours has been really special. And this is what I was hoping with this show, that this would be become part of the show, a big part of the show, having these kind of conversations. Be, before I started this, nothing but the truth, I was having conversations with these gentlemen, and, and, and I recognized this, how special this is and how rare it is to have a group of men get together and actually talk about these subjects and to be respectful, to understand where, they're coming from, where we're all coming from and have some common consensus. And um, so I, I don't know about you, but I've had a, a very long and rough week, and this has made, of course, this is the beginning of the new week, but <laughs> um, it just certainly has made my weekend. So um, I'm really uh, very appreciative of it. So, and as far as you know, if the folks who have been asking questions, there's been some great questions have been asked. Some of them are not on the topic at hand today, but like as far as 
what is blasphemy? I think in the future we should have a show just about that, defining what blasphemy is, because there seems to be out quite a few, quite a bit of confusion about that term, what it actually means. So I think in the future, hopefully we'll do that. As far as your, you know, next time we get together, if you want to go over the Geneva Bible, you know, whatever, you know, I, so far I, I, I've, I've come to do trust whatever you want to bring up. Um, I value your opinion and your research. So, so far you haven't let any of us down. So if you want to go over the Geneva Bible, we certainly can do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, this is my experience that I've had over the past six months, I would say, of getting a chance to get together, you know, once in a while with these gentlemen and have these kind of conversations. And um, and I recognize how special it is and how rare it is. And so I'm really grateful that this is being recorded. Those who, who are listening, I'm really grateful that you are listening. Um, folks who will listen in the future, I think you, you'll get a lot out of it, you know. You know, it's something that is lacking in Western culture is this conversation, having these types of conversations that are meaningful, that are pertinent, and, you know, really do offer solutions to our day-to-day struggles in life. You know, most of the time it's just heated debates about really nothing, circular reasoning, arguments that go nowhere, and it pretty much leads you to... um, you know, hating one side or the other. So, and it's, you know, <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, and, it, you know, a comments have been made about the thing about the amen thing. And, um, you know, I think it's, for whatever it's worth, I, I, I agree with the, the guest force that it's not a salva- salvation issue. I don't think it's going to condemn a man if he uses that or not. But if a man's conscience is such and it bothers him, not to say amen, we should respect that too and uh, leave it at that, you know what I mean? I think yeah. God, God is wiser than we are. He knows better than we are and what our intentions are where he knows what's in our hearts. So. And as time goes on, you know, if, if Wayne proves to be absolutely right about it and others like Wayne, well, then, you know, it's our own us to, to respect that one way or the other. So, And I value also what Tom says too. I do think that part of that is is potential threat or diminishing the value of the Bible, King James Bible in particular, so one way or the other. So um, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that I think it's an issue that it's it's worthy on its own merits to have a discussion about, but... Uh, Michael, Michael when, it, when it comes to the word amen, which is in the King James Bible throughout the New Testament, I, I I have this to say, and that is I don't want to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And the camel, in this case, is destroying the King James Bible. Yeah, I hear you. Oh. Yeah, I well, I will only say this, that you both know that that's the Bible that I read, the 1611 King James Authorized Version. Yeah, we... But I will also say this. And no, I'm not a Jesuit. And no, I'm not trying to throw (laughs) whatever. King James was a Roman sympathizer. So let us look at history also. And we should never bear in our minds the thought that the slickness of Satan, his hand is not ever at work. It never rests. This creature never rests. And its subtlety is above all. And I think we should keep that in our mind. That's all I say about that. And I'm not, and I am not trying to discredit King James Bible in any way, shape, or form. Period. Period. Yeah. I want that okay, to here interrupt also there okay. because I want to say something on that Amy question also, and then we can uh, co- come to the conclusion of that subject of our discussion. Right, and you can. Yeah. I didn't reading. bring I didn't bring that up on discrediting the King James Bible. And by the way, the King James Bible is not the majority read Bible because the majority read Bible is probably the Catholic Bible, the NIV, and I don't know which version involved. But the point that I was making on the Amen is that the word Amen to uh, end the prayers is used in every Bible, not just the King James. Also the 
Geneva Bible, the Lutheran Bible, the NIV, the NSV, I, I don't know, all the names, the Dewey Bible, of course, the Jesuit Bible. In every Bible, the word Amen is used. So this is the only word that all the Bibles, whether Protestant Bibles or Roman Catholic Bibles, Satanic Bibles, have in common. You're absolutely That's the right. point I was making. You're absolutely right about it, Europe. And if, they ch if they've changed all the other Bibles, words, taking Jesus Christ's name out of the Bible completely, like the New International Version did, and I showed that to my wife, and I threw the Bible away, and why, why would Amen be in them Bibles? If Amen in the Temple of Karnak, and I don't want to go on a tangent, was the greatest worship of temple ever created by man, who was worshipped there? Amen was. Why would it be in them Bibles? <laughs> That's the only question I put out. Why would it be? That's a good question. <clears throat> and, and other thing, other thing too is, um, like guess for brings up, you know, the King James son became a Catholic, and he was he married a Catholic. Who did? Uh, Who did? Uh, King, King, King James son. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. And, and, and um, you know, I don't know. King James, as far as him being a Roman sympathizer, I know that he had struggles in, in and out politically. I think there was a lot of issues there, but he was a Catholic. You know, regardless, uh, Michael, he was a Catholic, one hundred percent. Well, whatever he was, at the end of the day, uh, he actually didn't write the Bible, did he? No, no. no. <laughs> and the next thing is, you know, he, it is the most accurate English translation that we have. So, yep. sure well, nobody. You know, Nobody questioned that here on the call. No. Nobody no. denies that. No. Right. The, the only thing I was mentioning is that the only thing the King James Bible has in common with all the other Bibles is that all Bibles in the world and used today, whatever language, use the word Amen to finish a prayer. I wouldn't That's be the only thing. And I don't. I don't dismiss the. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't slander the King James Bible by by saying that. That's just a fact. And that was my point when telling, when the majority says amen, maybe we have to think about that the majority, mostly of the time, is wrong. I wouldn't, be a, bit all. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to discover that the, the, the Muslim's holy book, they call it, the Quran, uses the word amen too. I wouldn't doubt it a bit. Right. They worship well, Mary also. There was, there was uh, a prayer last week or the week before that was held in uh, in a Catholic church in Washington, D.C., where Imam was invented, uh, in, invited. I didn't know if you see that the, the, on no. YouTube, the video went around about that Imam who was praying a prayer in a Catholic church in Washington, D.C. Yep. yep. And he ended his prayer with Amen. Yep, sure did. Certainly enough to raise suspicion about that word. Anyway, Yerk, we could go on about this one word all night long. I want to hear what you got to say about yeah, this. That is, that, is, yeah, that is futile. That leads to nothing. Yeah, and that yeah. was also not the idea of the broadcast. Right. I only thought uh, I'd bring this up and what everybody else does when, when, he, uh, um, when he thinks about it, that, that is on his own. But sometimes people need things to think about. And maybe this is just one thing to reflect. Why is it that this world is in, or a world is in all the Bibles the same, and maybe it has to do with the Egypt origin or not? I, I don't know, and we don't, you know, we're not going to solve this discussion tonight at this point. And this is, first and for all, not brought up to discredit the King James Bible, of, of which I'm a very uh, big fan. I, I even ordered uh, a book, King James Bible. I read it normally online, but I even ordered a book from America. The AD 1611 King James Version, and I have it here at my home. I love that Bible. So, nothing against the King James Bible. But now I will read my little article that I have prepared, Why the Protestant Reformation Failed. It seems that most mainstream Christians cannot fully grasp the tremendously important role God's Holy Sabbath has played in church history. For instance, what part did the Sabbath play in the Reformation? The Reformers paid a terrible price for their rejection of the Seventh-day Sabbath and for their refusal to accept it as an article of revolt against the Catholic Church. They flatly rejected the Sabbath rest of the Scriptures. 
They claim to follow the written word only, the Bible as uh, we now call it, and to refuse the traditions of the church. Sunday is a tradition of the Roman church that has not one text word of divine authority. Martin Luther was not the staunch advocate of truth that many suppose. He is highly praised for claiming to follow the scriptures only. He stated that he was discarding all tradition. He and the reformers, so-called, were challenged at the termination of the Council of Trent by Archbishop of Reggio. He said all, <clears throat> uh, all their claims of discarding tradition were false as long as they retained Sunday. This rejection of the Seventh-day Sabbath was also a tradition instituted by the Catholic Church. This change in the day of worship is nowhere to be found in the Scripture. Almost unknown to most Christian literature is the name of Andreas Rudolf B. Karlstadt, or in English pronounced Andreas Rudolf D. Karlstadt, the great apostle of the Seventh-day Sabbath. He was born in Karlstadt, Bavaria, Germany, in 1480, and died in Basel, Switzerland, on December 25, 1541, at the age of 61 years. Karlstadt was a personal friend and co-worker with Martin Luther, but strenuously opposed him on the Sabbath issue. Karlstadt observed the Seventh-day Sabbath and taught his observance. Dobini says that Luther himself admitted that Karlstadt was his superior in learning. That is taken from field, uh, Five Fields History, Reference Book 10, page 315. Wow. The rejection of the Sabbath at the Council of Trent at once crippled the advance of the Reformation. Protestants and Protestant reformers will be held responsible on Judgment Day for their unfaithfulness at the time when the entire Roman Church pivoted toward discarding all tradition. At this point, let us refer to the eminent Dr. Dowling. In his History of Romanism, Book 2, Chapter 1, he says, quote, The Bible and the Bible only is the religion of Protestants. End quote. It is further of no account in the estimation of a genuine Protestant how early a doctrine uh, originated if it is not found in the Bible. End quote. Hence, if a doctrine be propound for his acceptance, he asks, quote, Is it found in the inspired word? Was it taught by the Lord Jesus Christ or his apostles? End quote. It did not matter to him whether it had been discovered in the, most, uh, in the musty folio of some uh, ancient visionary of the 3rd and 4th century or whether it emerged from the fertile brain of some modern visionary of the 19th century. If it was not found in the sacred scriptures, it presented no valid claim to be received as an article of a religious creed. He who receives a single doctrine from the mere authority of tradition by so doing steps down from the Protestant rock passes over the line that separates Protestantism from popery and gives no reason why and gives no reason why he should not receive all the earlier doctrines and ceremonies of Romanism. Agreed. That is powerful. Again, the Italian historian Gavassi says a pagan flood flowing into the church carried with its customs, practices and idols. That's from Gervasi's lectures, page 229, uh, 290, sorry. To quote another authority, Dr. White, Bishop of Eli, quote, the observance of the seventh day was being revived in Luther's time by Karlstadt. That's from Treatise of the Sabbath, page 8. And from Sears' Life of Luther, page 402, Karlstadt held to the divine authority of the Sabbath from the Old Testament. Indeed, Luther says, says in his book against the celestial prophets, quote, Indeed, if Karlstadt were to write further about the Sabbath, Sunday would have to give way, and the Sabbath, that is to say, Saturday, must be kept holy. Karlstadt said, In regard to the ceremonies of the church, all are to be rejected which have not a warrant in the Bible. Luther asserted, on the contrary, whatever is not against the scripture is for it. 
Not so, said Karlstadt. We are bound to the Bible, and no one may decide after the thoughts of his own heart. From C.S. Life of Luther, pages 401 and 402. Quote, I, it cannot be denied that in many respects Karlstadt was in advance of Luther, and doubtless the Reformation owes him much for which he has not the credit. That's from McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia, Volume 2, page 123. References in the following paragraph are taken from History of the Sabbath by Andrews, 3rd edition, 1887. Quote, From the Catholic, Roman, teaching of justification by works, of penance, etc., Luther went to the opposite extreme of justification without works. This idea caused him to deny that the epistle of James was inspired, because James said, quote, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone, end quote. This attitude made Luther spurn the true Christian Sabbath. Read what Draper says, quote, toward the close of Luther's life, it seemed as if, it were no other, uh, as if there were no other prospects for papal power than total ruin. Yet at this day, 1930, out of 300 million Christians, more than half owe allegiance to Rome. 1967, Muslims 500 million, Roman Catholics 550 million at least. Almost as by enchantment, the Reformation ceased to advance. Rome was not only able to check its spread, but even to gain back a portion of what it had lost. Protestant victory almost won, but lost. Why? Now, in dealing with the Council of Trent, held in northeast of Italy, lasting between 1545 and 1563 AD, and I'm adding totally, totally under the yoke of the just in 1450 erected Jesuit order. It's the Council of Trent is totally Jesuit doctrine from A to Z. From do, you, do you know that the black monks originally created the Inquisition, that the Jesuits came and destroyed them? Yeah, it was the uh, Dominicans. That's right. Exactly the Je- right. Yep. Yes, that's right. And that's the right. Jesuits, the Jesuits were, uh, in a sense, in a sense, don't, don't misquote me. In a sense, the Jesuits were, were reformers in the Roman Catholic Church. What the Jesuits' position was is that uh, the whole Roman Catholic Church was, was um, what's the correct word? Not apostate. Uh, it, was, it was corrupt. And because of the universal corruptness in the Roman Catholic Church, and the, the dereliction of the popes at the time, that led to the Protestant Reformation. And the best way to defeat the Protestant Reformation was to, quote-unquote, don't misquote me, to reform the Roman Catholic Church, or rather, more, more correctly, to purge out the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. Right, and that's to make what Luther them, was and, trying to do. Yeah, well, he was trying to do it according to the scriptures, and the Jesuits were trying to do it according to the dictates of Satan, their master. Yep. And uh, uh, this this is a wonderful work, but the but the the Dominicans were established as the Pope's inquisitors, and because of the corruption in the Dominican order, because of the corruption. Of, of the inquisitors, the Jesuits took over the Inquisition. Right. And as, you know, they're still in charge of the Inquisition. And, of course, it's not a circuit of priests anymore that go from town to town uh, promising great rewards if you rat out a heretic or a Protestant. Now the Inquisition is global world wars. Okay, the Pope, the the there's no need for that little circuit of, of Dominicans or Jesuits to go around and, and persecute the saints. Nations and, and, and allegiances of nations, uh, whole uh, entire 
world wars are how the Roman Catholic Church now wages its inquisition against the heretics. That's why people keep saying, well, the inquisition is over. No, no it, it, it has just grown so big and so systematic that no one even no one even equates what's going on in the world today with the inquisition of the old world order. But this, this is a very powerful Well, it's the medical I inquisition. Must... Is, it, you know, it's just yeah. it's never stopped. It's never stopped. Yeah. Oh, boy. I love these discussions. Okay. Though. Please continue, York. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm just repeating the last sentence again. Now, in dealing with the Council of Trent held in the northeast of Italy uh, and lasting from 1545 to 1563 AD, we must quote another well-versed writer, G.E. Fifield, D.D., in his incomparable tract, Origin of Sunday as a Christian question mark, festival, published by American Sabbath Tract Society, Seventh-day Baptist Church. To quote Dr. Fifield, quote, at the Council of Trent, taught by the Roman Church to deal with questions arising out of the Reformation, it was at first an apparent possibility that the Council would declare in favor of the Reformed doctrines instead of against them. So profound was the impression made thus far by the teachings of Luther and other Reformers. End quote. The Pope's legate actually wrote to him that there was strong tendency to set aside tradition altogether and to make the scriptures the sole standard of appeal. The question was debated day by day until it was fairly <clears throat> brought to a standstill. Finally, the Archbishop of Reggio uh, turned the Council against the Reformation by the following argument. Quote, the Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only they profess to hold the scriptures alone as the standard of faith. They justify their revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. Now the Protestants claim that they stand upon the written word alone is not true. End quote. Why Lutheran claim was not true. Next paragraph. Quote. Their profession of holding the scriptures alone as the standard of faith is false. Proof. The written word explicitly enjoys the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day, but reject it. If they truly hold the scriptures alone as the standard, they would be observing the seventh day as it is enjoined in the scripture throughout. Yet, they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath as enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday for which they have only the tradition of the Catholic Church. End quote. Now, were, were these statements made at the Council of Trent? That was a statement made by the Archbishop of Reggio in the Council of Trent. Oh. Because like, like I said before, in the Council of Trent, they seem to say not go against the Reformation, but go with them. Until he pointed out, well, when they claim that only the written word counts for us, why do they hold, hold Sunday? Now That's it the makes, reason why we are doing this whole broadcast. Now it makes me wish I had a transcript, a, a legal transcript of everything that transpired at the Council of Trent, because... There's obviously more that went on at the Council of Trent than I've ever heretofore been aware of. Well, I would like to interject one thing here, and I'm not trying to sell my website in any way, shape, or form. But on my website, if you look, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. I have probably minimal, and I know you've read this, Tom, you, York, probably also, minimal, minimal, 15 quotes from the popes throughout history who've announced this very thing, that Protestants knowingly, willingly subject themselves to the Sunday law given by the Pope through Constantine in 321. Just going along right with what York is saying. I mean, I have their words, 
And I love condemning them with their own words. So, Yes, by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Mm-hmm. And Rome's own words are the best way to condemn her. Yep, that's what I choose. Yes. And when it comes to Sabbath, I was unaware that that was an issue at the Council of Trent. I, read more, Jerk. I'm interested in this. Did I lose everybody? I've had a bad internet connection lately. Well, I've got a good connection. Where is it? Yurk may have slipped there? away for a sec. Yurk yeah. may have... Yeah, Dork, no. are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, 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 I muted my mic. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now we just thought we lost Sorry. you, brother. We thought we lost. No, no, no. It's that's all right. That's all right. Sorry, that was my mistake. <laughs> I just <clears throat> I just muted my mic because I took a, a little sip of water. Uh, yeah. No, I said I'm, I'm going to repeat this last paragraph because it's, it goes on the paragraph about that. So I'm going to read these two together now. So I'm going to just repeat this last paragraph, uh, which is still the uh, quote from uh, Archbishop Reggio uh, from the Council of Trent. Quote, their profession of holding the scriptures alone as the standard of faith is false. Proof, the written word explicitly enjoys the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day, but reject it. If they truly hold the scriptures alone as the standard, they would be observing the seventh day as it is enjoined in the scripture throughout. Yet, they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath as enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday, for which they have only the tradition of the Catholic Church. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as standard fails, and the doctrine of Scripture and tradition uh, as essential is fully established as Protestants themselves being judges. See the Proceedings of the Council of Trent, Augsburg's Confession, and the Encyclopedia Britannica article, Trent, Council of. At this argument, at the party that had stood for the scripture alone surrendered, and the council at once anonymously condemned Protestantism and the whole Reformation, it at once proceeded to enact stringent decrees to arrest its progress. What were the results of the Reformation? Now, what were the results of the Reformation? Let us hear what Myers says. Quote, the outcome of the revolt, very broadly stated, was the separation from the Roman Catholic Church of the northern or Teutonic nations, that is to say, of northern Germany, parts of Switzerland and the Netherlands, and of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, England and Scotland. The Roman nations, namely Italy, France and Spain, together with Celtic Ireland, adhered to the old church. End quote. Of the spiritual results of the revolt, the same writer says, in a spiritual or religious point of view, this severance of the northern nations nations of the bond that formerly united them to the ecclesiastic empire of Rome meant the transfer of their allegiance. And he finally sums up, thus one half of the Western Christendom was lost to the Roman Church. End quote. From this we see that the Roman Church, attacked by the reformers, had at one time faced utter defeat, but she recovered. The reformers had dealt a death blow to the papacy. Unfortunately, the reformers themselves bound up the wound by clinging to Sunday, Rome's day, and to other papal traditions. They rejected the Sabbath of the scriptures. Conclusion. Come out of her, my people. Revelation 18, verse 4. Praise God. That was the article that I wanted to read, and I think we have really gone into that thing that I said from the beginning about the reformers. Why didn't they go the whole nine yard? And when you have scripture and scripture alone, and you leave out the fourth commandment, you are not having scripture and scripture alone. And this is the back door they left open, because in the last 500 years that the Reformation took place, Everybody who is a so-called Protestant does everything a Protestant has to do according to their scripture, but he observes Sunday. And that is why Rome will have it that easy to give all the people 
willingly the mark of the beast of Sunday observance, of Sunday law, whether combined with an RFID chip or not, but having the sign 666 in your head means that you accept in your head Rome's law, the power, uh, the papal power, the Roman Catholic system. Right. Following Babylonian sun worship. Yeah. What what you've been talking about, Yerk, this issue about Sabbath versus Sunday, is the very authority by which the papacy launched the ecumenical movement. That that is the ground floor issue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants. If you wish for the Protestant Reformation to continue, then you must deal with this issue about Sabbath. Otherwise, you must be ecumenically reunited with the Roman Catholic Church and submit to the authority of the papacy and the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the that's the issue. It, it's one or the other. You can't have it both ways. And listen, in, on this count, the papacy is correct. Which is it? Oh, yeah, and that's what I'm saying about going to my website, the Seventh-day Sabbath. They boast about it, these popes. They boast about it. Shame on the Protestants, brother. Shame on them. Because none protest the war today. And I believe this, and when it says those are your own house or your greatest enemies, I believe these people in these buildings that they call churches out here will be the ones, will be your inquisitors, turning you in. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. I want to say two, um, two quotes that I have here. The first quote comes from John Theodore Mueller. Sabbath or Sunday, page 15 and 16. And I can give you the link later if you want to. But the quote is, but they err in teaching that Sunday has taken the place of the Old Testament Sabbath and therefore must be kept as the seventh day had to be kept by the children of Israel. These churches err in their teaching for scripture has in no way ordained the first day of the week and place of the Sabbath. There is simply no law in the New Testament to that effect. And the second quote comes from Martin Luther, as written in Spiritual Antichrist, pages 71 and 72. Quote, I wonder exceedingly how it came to be imputed to me that I should reject the law of the Ten Commandments. Whosoever abrogates the law of necessity abrogate sin also. Must of necessity abrogate sin also. That's correct. But he didn't go far enough. No. Nope. It does not only abrogate sin, it abrogates Christ. For what did Christ die? For our sins. If there's no sin, if there's no law, there's no sin. If there's no sin, there's no need for Christ to die, and he died in vain. Full stop. Well, How subtle is this creature called Satan? <laughs> and how thoroughly has he corrupted the house of God? And that's why judgment begins at the house of God first, brother. That's right. He is the father of all lies. And I questioned and asked him, how? How could you walk away? You, well, throw it out, whatever, but you chose to walk away like Pharaoh. You were at the throne, man. You were there. You had it all. But, oh, no, that's not enough. I want me. Well, me is a piece.
piece of crap as far as I'm concerned. So, Like the Bible said in Hebrews 11, you know, they, they all had the, the chances to turn around and just to come back to what they had previous in the life, whether it was alcohol, dope, women, whores, whatever it was, whatever your love and lust was, money, power, whatever, greed, self-gain, vanity. But they chose to seek a far country where the Messiah is residing with the Father. So praise God that we seek that also. Now you feel what it's like to be truly alone in the world. Absolutely, Tom. I have for many years. Like when I discuss this very frequently. <laughs> well, I'm brother, by this right I'm, I'm really glad we did this uh, conversation today. I'm really glad we had this, although we started a little bit late. And... Um, I think it opened uh, a little bit uh, the eyes of, of, of some people, even even here with us. <laughs> I think even Tom learned something new. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God! <laughs> now we know. Now we know. Tom Press is fallible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let God be true, and every man a liar. Well, but I'm, I'm I'm very glad that we addressed this issue, and I think, of course, you can you can go into detail and you can uh, continue making conversation for this for 20 hours or whatever, but then you will still go to repeat yourself, yeah. because in the end it all comes to the same uh, little note that we already made in the beginning. We have to measure all words, all knowledge on the Bible, and uh, it is like this Archbishop of, uh, of Reggio sets. Well, the, when you say the Bible and the Bible alone, then you have to follow the Sabbath, seventh day rest. And if you don't do that, then your words are in vain. Agreed. And I am very sad to have said I once agree with the Roman Catholic. Agreed. What the words that that Archbishop spoke at the Council of Trent are true. And that's like the quotes I'm telling you on my site that the popes have stated. They state the same thing throughout history. They throw it right back in the Protestants' lap. That they're denying the true God and his word and his commandments. Well, then there's only the question why these Protestants left that door open. And that's brings me back to the beginning, Wayne, you were there already when I said that, but I read somewhere that Luther was maybe a Rosicrucian. Well, I'm not going to say if he was or wasn't. I wouldn't want to judge him because I don't know. I don't say that either. I only said that I I read this. I didn't live during that time, but and a piece of paper will lay still for anybody to write anything on. But I would say this again to you, that it's possible that he carried forth the doctrines of the Catholic Church that have been instilled in him since he was a baby. Who knows? You know how hard that is to get rid of stuff since you've been born. You know, they take little girls when they're born. Oh, and she pretty, she pretty, she pretty. And when she grows up, man, look at me, lust for me, baby, bow down. Here I am. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. Look, I, I for a while I went. Uh, hmm. I became critical of the Protestant reformers on this issue of Sabbath plus other issues that we haven't even mentioned yet. And I don't know if you want to go there or not, but we're probably going to run out of time. But uh, Sabbath wasn't the only issue. But I, I went, I went through those issues, and I began to ask myself and my listeners on Inquisition Update, what do we do about these things? What, what? You know, are are we to follow the, the these these errors of the Protestant reformers? No, we are not to follow man. No, follow God. Exactly. We oh. are to close. Listen, the the question is still open. You asked the question: Why did the Protestant reformers leave that back door open? The question is: 
should we keep it open? Nope. And the answer is clearly we should shut that door. We have today. We Absolutely. Have today. And we should deal with all the rest of the traditions of the so-called church that are not commanded in the scriptures. They have departed from the scriptures. They keep not only the traditions of men, but they keep diabolical traditions. And they call it Christianity. And it's not just Sabbath. I think Sabbath is is where this discussion should start, but it certainly shouldn't end with Sabbath. Well, that's why... Tom, I continue calling it paganized sun worship, you know. Tom, could you go through a short list of some of the traditions that you're talking about? Well, I've, I've, I've likened it this way, the unholy trinity of quote-unquote Christianity. Okay. And that is Sunday worship, Christmas, and Easter. And I don't want to get into a discussion about Christmas and Easter and take anything away from our discussion about Sabbath. No, this is just a good, a good point to kind of end on and for us to think about in the future of other yeah. topics to talk about. So, yeah. so Christmas and Easter are two topics that we certainly, you know, these holidays that we are forced to <laughs> impose upon us. Yeah, maybe maybe I can uh, intervene that right here. I made last year on the 25th of December a video on my YouTube channel, Juggler66, that you can still find, that was called The Only Thing I Want for Christmas is the Truth About Christmas. Praise <laughs> God. And um, that's only 15 minutes long, but I think you will enjoy it. <laughs> uh, you know, the holidays, as they call them, the holy days are coming up again. So uh, maybe that's a good idea to have a look at that. I mean, I'm not the only one who made a video on that. There are many people who did that, but uh, I really much enjoyed it. And for you guys in America, remember that while there still were only 13 colonies, um, there were official announcements in all the country that celebrating Christmas was forbidden. Interesting. Isn't Hail that man. interesting? I even Hail have man. a picture somewhere of, uh, and I'm not kidding you, of a, um, a banner that was made that, set, that states that. I, uh, I'm uh, having a look here at my pictures if I'm going to find that. Really, I have really a copy true. of that here upstairs in my paperwork and my books. Oh, okay. So, okay. If I don't find it, then you have it. But I, I, I have it. I, I, I know that I have. I saw that one. So, really, yeah, yeah. It was that banished is, in the colonies. Truth. That's for sure. And it's and yeah. it's bail mass. It's bail mass. X mass. Why did they put an X mass representing a cross turned forty-five degrees? You know, people they don't they don't think. That's what's wrong with the world. Nobody thinks anymore. Well gentlemen, I think I, I well gentlemen, I think this is probably a good time to end this. Um, <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> but you know, I think we have some great topics for the future to talk about. We got Absolutely Bail Mass, we got Easter, we got these holidays, we got the question of uh what is blasphemy that we could deal with. That could be a whole show in itself. The Trinity. Um, the Trinity? Oh yeah, the Trinity. We, if, we're, if we're willing to tackle it, you know, let's do the <laughs> Trinity. Um, you know, we got a, an awful lot of questions still to, to be uh, dealt with and answered. And um, and uh, for one more thing, you know, Mike, you know, this is how we operate. So you brought up that that King James is Catholic. I would appreciate if you could bring some documentation next time to or. Or sometime to bring, you know, to just York. I'll thing. tell you the truth, not passing a buck. York would be better for that because he's a better history buff with dates and so forth than I. Am. Right. I'm not trying to be controversial. No, 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 no. no. I'm, just, I'm just telling you, know you that this, that's this never been what my is, cup of tea to sit down and see. So this date, show is called date. Nothing But the Truth. So yeah. we know that's what we want to do, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. we don't want to give people the impression that we're, you know. Try to pass on misinformation and all that kind of stuff. So, 
Um, uh, it, it, so, yeah, I want to, from the bottom of my heart, gentlemen, I want to thank you for sharing this Sunday with me, this conversation. Uh, I feel immensely blessed. And um, I, I, I imagine others who have been listening to the show feel the same way. Um, we need more conversations like this. We need to be to hear these conversations. They're just not, they're not there in the mainstream. They're not there in the alternative media. They just don't happen in our day-to-day lives. And, you know, I, I want to express my deepest sincere gratitude that you're willing to have done this, to record this, that other people will be able to hear this. Um, I, I'm not blowing smoke up everyone's derriere. I mean, I, I mean, it, I, this is not about us. This is about the message and about hopefully that other people will hear it and cause them to think and reflect and to do something concrete about their lives instead of just, you know, an endless, you know, cycle of arguments and debates and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think really think it was really, really, really special. So hopefully Thursday uh, we can get together again in Reformation. Roman is in the Reformation 2014. Tom, if that works, we go and go over the, I guess, uh, we're supposed to do uh, flattery, if you want to do that still. If not, you can always change it. Um and if you can't do it, I understand that too. Um, because I, I guess I'm pinning you down, <laughs> seeing if you're going to do it or not, and let everyone else know. Are we going to do it Thursday, Tom? Yeah, we'll tackle flattery Thursday okay. at the program. Cool. And then uh, hopefully later on this week and get together with uh, Jorg from Juggler 66 and we can go over that uh, topics like uh, the Jesuit Bible and then hopefully. Look at forward. Look at yeah. Well, we first we will go into the Jesuit oath, the fourth oath of obedience, which we talked about last broadcast, and which is by so many people uh, said to be a forgery, which is absolutely not true. And because you know, I read last last uh, broadcast, I read from a dissertation, 72 pages or something, that a Belgian Jesuit wrote, where he mentioned this vow. So, right. no and one can deny that then anymore. But I, I just I, I I'd like to give you the last word of this broadcast, Michael. But I just want to end with one quote, please. Okay. And that is Exodus 20, verse eight, and the reason why we were came why we came together here this evening. And I just want to read it, and um, that will be my last word on this broadcast tonight. Okay. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy main servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. How appropriate. Thank you. Um, yeah, as far and oh yeah, one more thing. And and hopefully Wayne uh Saturday will be together with Wayne again and uh he's been reading uh, Babylon mystery religion and he's been doing a uh masterful job of reading that. That book is there's a lot of food for thought in that book too, so I strongly recommend anybody who has a chance to stop by and listen to that. We're going to try to do that more in the evening time. And it seemed that we had a few more folks that actually joined in than normal. We have been doing it to, like about this time on a Saturday, and it doesn't seem like there's too many folks around. So, But, um, yeah, thank you, gentlemen. I mean, once again, thank you very, very much. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this particular show all week. And it really didn't disappoint. Um, it was some really great stuff was shared. And um, I feel really fortunate and blessed that I even have this opportunity to listen to to me. So, um, and uh, hopefully we talk to each other soon. So with that, I think we're going to close it. And um, I don't know if there's any other closing comments on your parts. 
I'd like I'll to thank you closer. for having me on the show. Well, you're Sir, welcome. Certainly, may God bless this work and may it go forth. He be glorified. And my closing salutation is this. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Thank you. Um, yeah, this has been great. I can, I mean, I wish I could just do it the rest of the day. <laughs> so, welcome to our world, folks, and uh, come join us again. So, and God bless you all, and everyone have a great day. So, thank you. With that, for everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.